and uh, back again. We're, we're three days running, right? I have so much material to get through today. Um, and I actually started uh, this morning, and I'm, uh, this isn't going to be the focus, but maybe it's, it's nice to give everybody a little bit of a sneak preview of the next session. Uh, so the next session, probably tomorrow, I'm going to be doing a bit of a follow-up on uh, RFK Jr. and his connections to, uh, you know, speaking at the crypto conference and uh, the token economy. And, you know, I... Uh, Day before yesterday, I was talking about this guy, Aaron Van Diver, having uh, published a story, uh, one among many, in Children's Health Defense about eco-libertarian, the, the potential of eco-libertarianism. Uh, he's this author. And uh, he, in it, he references uh, in some detail this guy, uh, Jem Bendel, who was the former head of Extinction Rebellion. Uh, I don't know, head involved spokesperson. Um, and and I just I noticed today that Jem Bendel was uh, retweeting uh, the uh, uh, he Let's see. Is it is it this? He was he was retweeting um, something from Will Ruddick. And uh, so Will, Will Ruddick, uh, Leo has written a lot about him. Uh, he's connected to uh, this uh, Serafu. Uh, tokenized economics, uh, grassroots economics in Kenya. And uh, so I just, I wanted to sort of pull together uh, some information on that. And I'm not seeing the actual tweet right here, but he had retweeted something from Will Ruddick. And I was like, oh, so that's what we're about. We're about Will Ruddick. So um, yeah, so very close, a few steps away of RFK Jr. from the, the tokenized impact economy. Uh, but for those who are joining in today, I'm going to spend some time on Scientology, which I, I guess is um, uh, sort of one of these topics I, I hear I haven't seen it. There's like a whole mini series about all sorts of things about Scientology, and certainly it has its uh, own colorful, shall we say, history. Um, and I remember a while back coming across, and, and a lot of this is stuff like People who study Scientology and keep an eye on it, like they're their whole other breed. Um, so a lot of this isn't particularly new information, but I'm trying to put it together in the context of um, impact finance and um, sort of uh, privacy preserving uh, donations and organizing around uh, the health freedom space and particularly as it uh, pertains to the California chapter of Children's Health Defense, uh, which is... I think probably like one of its most active uh, chapters. And I, I wasn't particularly familiar with exactly how this all laid out. Because again, I wasn't paying super close attention to Children's Health Defense. I was never like a, a major uh, advocate of it because I knew that the things that they were pursuing, the story that they were in wasn't really what I was most interested and most concerned about. Uh, so I, I spent some time sort of getting back up to speed. And my understanding is that the, the California chapter was really probably best prepared to sort of jump in legally on a lot of these things uh, because there was this uh, measles outbreak uh, in 2015 at uh, here at the Wikipedia entry, Disneyland measles outbreak. Um, and then that was uh, th that uh, episode was what led to uh, introduction an introduction of this California Senate Bill 277 uh, that removed religious exemptions for children and schools around uh, jabs. And so, uh, but I, very interesting to me that it started out in Disneyland. Um, because as we remember, uh, Michael Eisner, this happened 10 years after he left. I think he left Disney in 2005. He was the CEO of the Walt Disney Company from 1984 to 2005. Uh, but he was pretty active in the expansion of these various theme parks, including uh, Disney's Hollywood Studio, Disneyland Paris, Animal Kingdom, California Adventure Park, Tokyo Disney, Disney Sea. Um, Walt du Disney Studios Park in Hong Kong Disneyland. So he was he was very active in the the uh, amusement park space. Um, and if you remember from the previous episode, that one of the longest standing board members of Children's Health Defense is Tarina Thine Tyne Eisner, uh, who is married to Michael Eisner's son Anders, and so she's a longtime board member. So I just thought that the uh, the Disneyland connection sort of piqued my interest um, there because we know Disneyland is sort of a, a prototype test bed for a lot of these, uh, shall we say, like group psychology technologies. Um, and then I just have an image here of this California Senate Bill 277. And so early on, people who were concerned about um, 
uh, rights for autonomy around healthcare decisions and things like they were coming together and organizing to oppose the passage of this bill, which did pass. And it's interesting because it was signed into law by Jerry Brown and um, uh, Jerry Brown is very active in the social impact finance space, particularly in Oakland and UBI and the, this up together uh, uh, poverty management framework. Um, so yeah, so it was signed by him and uh, you know, among the people who were opposing uh, were included the Nation of Islam. And uh, and so this this led me to um, essentially I was I was spending some time looking at this is this is Tony Muhammad, uh, who it, who is active in Los Angeles, uh, who is a member of who is a Scientologist, connected to Scientology, uh, and was known for uh, his involvement in reducing gang violence in Los Angeles. Uh, you, you can see him. Uh, here's a video of him with the Scientology channel, Voices for Humanity, Mr. Tony Muhammad, and, uh, you know, talking about, I think, like, were they doing motorcycle rides or something uh, to sort of stop gang violence? Uh, but, but it's this wedding of... Uh, which happened, I think, really starting around 2006 or so, uh, introducing um, this this sort of black radical community to Scientology and, and auditing, and and that was happening uh, with with uh, Muhammad and and Farrakhan, and you know, there's a. I, I have a screenshot here of an article about it. Uh, I, I'll just read this this screenshot out. Uh, it's, it says, uh, Louis Farrakhan, the leader of the Nation of Islam for more than three decades, said that he had first heard about Scientology 35 years ago from a former nation minister who became a Scientologist. But the story of how Farrakhan came to embrace it concerns a nation minister in Los Angeles named Tommy Muhammad. In 2005, Muhammad was beaten by the LAPD at a prayer vigil he'd helped organize for a young man killed in a drive-by shooting. The incident plunged him into an agitated, depressed state, and a concerned friend introduced him to Scientology, which he credits for saving his life. And then when Farrakhan met with Muhammad, he was amazed by the transformation, as Muhammad tells it in an audio clip posted on YouTube, whatever you're on, I want some of it. The first large-scale introduction of Scientology to nation members took place in August 2010, when hundreds of believers from around the country traveled to Rosemont, Illinois, near the nation's headquarters for a seminar in Dianetics, a foundational belief system of Scientology. Uh, they were guided through auditing sessions, a kind of hybrid between hypnosis and confession in which a Scientologist purges painful experiences from his subconscious in the presence of an auditor. And at the end of the seminar, Farrakhan told the group that he wanted everyone in attendance be to become a certified auditor. And uh, so so Muhammad was was active in this pushback around uh, uh, Senate Bill 277 in California. And uh, this is uh, an article, this gentleman, Tony Ortega, has a very uh, extensive blog uh, focused on Scientology. Um, and again, for the most part, a lot of the criticisms in this is coming from people who um, are probably not aligned with the health freedom outlook, right? And so uh, so that is conveyed in this article. But what I wanted to share here is this image uh, that has uh, Brian Hooker, uh, RFK Jr. and Tony Muhammad uh, in a Scientology facility in Los Angeles. And they're they're presenting um, around the activism around the that Senate bill. Uh, I, I think it says on the background, like justice or else. And so there's these three men. Now I will point out, um, that Brian Hooker, um, and again, it, you know, I, I tread lightly on this because I know that it's, um, you know, he, he's the parent of a vaccine injured child. And so I in no way want to make light of uh, the, the pain of that or to diminish his uh, activism around that issue that is directly impacting him and his family. Uh, but given that we know so much of what is coming is connected to um you know, synthetic biology. I mean, it's very interesting that he's now a professor at Simpson University in Redding, California, um, saying that this is from the Children's Health Defense website, that he specializes in biotechnology, right? That That's his business. And that, um, again, this is from the, the website of Children's Health Defense, uh, that he dedicated 15 years as a bioengineer 
and was the team leader for the high throughput biology team and the operations manager of uh, DOE Genomics, uh, the Center for Molecular and Cellular Systems at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, which is a Department of Energy laboratory. And the Department of Energy is really central to everything that is rolling out. It says that he was the uh, research director for the plant biotechnology phytogenics. Um, and so, you know, I, to me, that that's important. He he was also, I'm not sure exactly, like he was a, 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 a director and was also appointed the chief science officer and paid uh, $81,677 in 2021, according to the 990. So he's he's a paid staff person, or at least was for that year, um, as their chief science officer. And I think someone who is involved specifically in biotechnology, again, um, focusing more on plants than people, uh, but his outlook is from a biotech frame. So, um, you know, I, I think that that is important to consider. And in, uh, let's see, in his uh, uh, LinkedIn, it, it describes him, uh, here's here's where it's listed. Let's see, wait a minute. A senior research engineer and team leader at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Richland, Washington. And um, again, that that's a Department of Energy lab. Uh, and his focus was uh, management of bioremediation and applied plant molecular biology. Uh, and then it says for three years, he was also a senior process consultant to Ares Corporation uh, in, in Richland. And then when you look up Ares Corporation, uh, their customers include NASA, the Missile Defense Agency, Space Force, the Air Force, DARPA, and commercial space. <laughs> um, so that's a little worrisome. And um, again, yeah, this is the, the Aries uh, LinkedIn. Uh, it is one of the foremost engineering project management, reliability, and mission assurance IT architecture and security and software solutions company in the US. Um, so again, yeah, working with, with DARPA and, uh, you know, he holds a number of patents, um, including uh, chimeric genes to transform plant cells and plants. Um, and, you know, one of the, the papers, they were talking about how he worked in the area of uh, uh, plant biosensors specifically. I think maybe this is it. Um, this is his uh, Wikipedia entry as a Wikipedia entry. Um, it says that he has uh, uh, been involved in research in microbial kinetics and transport mathematical modeling, uh, design development and support for biological destruction of chlorinated hydrocarbons, development of TP4 transgenic plant protein production platform technology, and development of RT3D bioremediation natural attenuation software package. Um, and then the first line, it says he formerly managed applied plant and fungal molecular biology research projects, including development of plant-based biosensors and transgenic production systems for human pharmaceutical proteins and industrial enzymes, uh, using uh, where systems biology researchers are focused on understanding gene and protein networks in individual cell signaling and communication between cells in communities and cellular metabolic pathways. So to me, I mean, that seems like it would be very much in line with this idea of, um, uh, I don't know, uh, Personalized medicine, precision medicine. I mean, they're they're working on human pharmaceuticals. It's he's working in fungi and plants, uh, but we you know you know there's a lot of crossover. So again, as the the parent of a vac uh, you know a, a child who has suffered a vaccine injury, like I I I don't mean to dismiss that difficulty, but it is an interesting choice for him ha to have been appointed the chief science officer, uh, really a biotech specialist on biosensors uh, who worked for the Department of Energy. I mean, I, I find that pretty notable. And again, here's here here, here he is. Um, here he is in that space on the 990. OK, so 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 they're all at this. OK, so so here, you know, just just to repeat, Brian, Brian Hooker is there with Tony Muhammad and RFK Jr. in 2015. Uh, so, you know, pre-lockdowns, pre-lockdowns, they already have this relationship sort of established. And uh, the, the other thing is I was looking into uh, their digital media assets, uh, which was, let me see, working specifically on, 
Yeah. So in their form 990 from 2021, uh, it spe specifies that they have two subordinate organizations, CHD Publishing LLC, that EIN is 85-279-6239. I've looked it up. I can't find anything for that EIN. Um, and then there's also Children's Health Defense Films LLC, uh, and that EIN is 85-2807267. Uh, and I couldn't find anything on that either. But they have two separate organizations, like subsidiaries of the main children's health defense. And I was looking into that because honestly, um, in the impact finance space, I realized that a lot of um, documentary films even though they might be really good stories, are linked to social impact investing. Um, and I wanted to know a little bit more about that. So I was looking into these uh, various digital media assets. Uh, this is taken from the job summary for the senior copywriter that was listed within the last couple months. Uh, and th the, the department that this job is in is the marketing and communications department. And uh, they're involved in large scale education campaigns uh, working with the chapters, working on the CHD TV shows, uh, litigation activity, the CHD, CHD films, and the CHD's imprint book series. And so these two subsidiaries are sort of an active part of the educational program there. Um, and, you know, I, I did think it was interesting. I'm just going to mention uh, this as well when we're talking about CHD DTV and these digital assets. Um, now, maybe if CHDTV is part of the subsidiary, it doesn't count. But in an email, like a solicitation email, where they were no, uh, noting that RFK Jr. Uh, was going on leave for the campaign, as were, well as uh, Mary Holland. Uh, and so her Mary Holland's title was changed to CHD's president on leave and general counsel on leave. Uh, but I, I will note that you know, this week I was looking at the CHD TV website um, and Mary Holland has two different appearances on CHD TV. Um, one is episode 116 of uh, Good Morning CHD TV on May 7th. Uh, and then there's another one, episode uh, 122 of the CHD Book Club, Turtles All the Way Down. That's on May 23rd. And so... Um, so Mary is still, even though she's on leave, is showing up on the media outlets. And to me, again, I've sort of asked, I've thought to myself, what's happening with, you know, the money that's flowing in? Like, are they, when people donate to Children's Health Defense, are they, um, do they have, to, are they presuming that it's staying within Children's Health Defense? Or is it getting filtered over into some of the other digital media outlets? I'm not sure what the requirements are for that. If you, they can move money around between the film company and the production company um, from the master organization. But it seems like these are entities that at this point with running a presidential candidate, from a conflict of interest standpoint, if you're trying to keep your distance, then really she should be stepping away from all of the activities of Children's Health Defense, including the subsidiary programs with the CHD TV. Otherwise, there's a potential perception of conflict of interest and in using the organization for political purposes, which um, to me would seem to be problematic and, and, you know, feels a little bit like how convenient that you've set up a sort of a media empire just as your candidate is, you know, uh, getting ready. It's It just seems a bit tricky there. Uh, so I'd been looking at these films. Uh, as far as I can tell, again, I was talking about impact media, that these are being set up to drive impact markets for uh, not just for, for literal uh, behavior change. Uh, so I, I have this article that's about the impact media that I that I talk about that a little bit. Uh, another article that features this documentary, No Small Matter, uh, which is pushing early childhood education again as an as an impact finance marketplace. And in that uh, blog post that I wrote, it was featuring a clip from this woman, Diana Barrett of Harvard Business School, and she's with uh, fledgling films. And she's telling us, this is at Columbia uh, Business School uh, production uh, in 2012, so 10 years ago, how this works with documentary film production. And so I'm going to go ahead and play this clip for you. It's only about two and a half minutes, so we can hear from Diana exactly how these film programs, what the real purpose is behind them. So let me see. I'll... 
asked to see some footage of a film that I'd never heard of uh, about India. And that was very appealing because I've been to India many times on an HIV AIDS project at Harvard, the Kennedy School. And um, so I went up to this weird little room, which I now know is an editing room, and uh, uh, saw something that I now understand was an assembly cut. And it was a film called Born into Brothels. And that was the first film I ever got involved in. So I began thinking that there was a way of really using something other than the written word. I grew up with a written word. And with a written word, you know, you spend a year writing an article and uh, 11 people read it and nine disagree. And then I thought, wouldn't it be great to really be able to use something that was visual to change people's minds? And I have three kids and I kind of grew up in a visual media through them and Harvard Business School became very visual when I was there. So all of this appealed to me. So we started uh, Fledgling, just to give you a quick snapshot. We have a new website coming out in about two weeks and all these snapshots will be on the website. But we've put about nine and a half million dollars into 268 different projects over the past five years. And we do that. It's a family foundation plus a variety of funders. Now we have uh, Ford Foundation is funding us and the Home Depot Foundation and about a dozen individuals as well. Um, so we become very strategic. We look at inflection points and kind of leverage points where strategically we can really make a difference. We become very, very systematic. We used to put more money into production. Now we do almost no production funding. We have two submission cycles a year. It actually closed last night and I just got a message this morning a few minutes ago that we have more submissions than we've ever had before. So it's about 1,100 submissions, and out of that we choose about 35 films. So we're very, very systematic about what we do. Um, we are all about impact. Every film is chosen because we think for one reason or another it can reach audiences, change minds, change laws, which I'm not supposed to talk about. Um, uh, uh, but, because uh, we're not supposed to do that, but it does. Um, and I'll talk about that specifically. And so we look at every possibility <laughs> The internal revenue. Right, right, exactly. Um, we look at every film from the vantage point of what can we do, and we're very involved now in transmedia projects, looking at the visual and the written and assemblies of people and conferences, and I absolutely love what I do because I get to think about big ideas in ways that will have an impact, and I get to work with young people now in the form of filmmakers as opposed to students, and I get to do a lot of this, which is very exciting. All right, so you heard... Back to this. Um, all right, so you heard her say um, that they're investing in films for impact, right? It's highly selective, and their goal is to change policy, change laws. Now, they're not supposed to do that because that goes against um, the uh, the IRS, their IRS status, but they do it anyway, right? Everybody, this is uh, Columbia Business School, right? They know these things. And so when I was... Uh, you know, thinking about the children's health defense film production, um, you know, I was looking, okay, so they, they have two films. Uh, one of them is uh, Medical Racism, The New Apartheid. Uh, and then on the website, it has the filmmakers. And look, there's David Sentner is the executive producer. And I'm pretty sure that the executive producer are the people who are putting up the money. Um, and... Uh, so, and I, you know, I mentioned David Sentner before, he made his money in automated tolls connected to like rental cars. He's ba he and his wife are based in Florida. They have the uh, happiness school down there. And, um, and he's also into technology and, and uh, reputation management, right? And so, so he's, he and RFK Jr. are here listed as filmmakers, but then underneath is also Kevin Jenkins, who is now the, uh, I think, the chair of the Florida chapter of Children's Health Defense, and uh, Tony Muhammad and uh, Curtis Cost. And, uh, you know, so we were just talking about Tony Muhammad and the Scientology. And so it says here that he was, uh, Tony Muhammad was, um, you know, building bridges between people of diverse races, religions, and beliefs at local, state, and national levels. In 2012, he co-founded United in Peace Movement in the streets of South Los Angeles, bringing together these rival gangs. And so again, United in Peace, I keep saying peace is sort of a charged word. There's a lot, you know, mixed into that. Um, and then he, his, uh, his, his movement is diminishing violent crime through distribution of, quote, the Million Man March Pledge and the way to happiness, a common sense moral code. Um, and it, it says he's a regional representative for the Nation of Islam uh, and the student Western regional minister of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan in the Nation of Islam. 
Uh, but it doesn't say that he's he's uh, uh, someone who who introduced uh, the nation of Islam to Scientology. The Scientology part isn't isn't on there. So um, so that's sort of what got me looking today. Um, again, this is <clears throat> uh, this is from a video transcript. Uh, it's, it's talking about the Church of Scientology and the Nation of Islam. It should be held in high esteem by all of us. So groups like the Nation of Islam, the Catholic Church, the Muslims, all of the world, if we see good in one another, we should take the good, learn from it, exchange it, do what other nations do, trade, trade the point of view. And I'm thankful in this hour I found a betterment group. Uh, we were told in the Nation of Islam at the time in our development, we would be meet other purified people who would show us things uh, that we can be in exchange with and take tools back to our community. And that's what I like about the Church of Scientology. You don't hold back information. It's here for anyone to get it, anyone to take their own religious idea, culture, ethnicity. I'm telling you, and that's the beauty, what I love. I don't feel a stranglehold. In fact, I've become a better Muslim as a result of my relationship to the Church of Scientology. Um, and then this is an image they're doing uh, motorcycle rallies, I guess, peace rides in, in L.A., and, you know, so much of, you know, really a lot of children's health defense has these ties to California. Here's another video of Tony Muhammad uh, from Scientology, uh, you know, just just to sort of like show that it's, it's, it's not a hidden connection. There is a second film that I found that's about infertility uh, that has a little less information on it. Uh, it's uh, infertility, a diabolical agenda. Oh, this is connected to Andy Wakefield. Uh, so this is his his film. Uh, so we so so far as far as I can tell that there are these two films, but the Scientology connection sort of jumped out at me. And then I was remembering back at the time uh, that I had heard that Lee Dundas, who was sort of very prominent early on um, in I think Orange County, uh, California, uh, that sh that she was also a Scientologist. And you know there there's a resource online I guess that looks up you know various people and. Um, you know, it, it's, it shows that she's completed various levels of Scientology, um, including, I guess, the most recent thing listed in, is in 2014, the London Congress on Dissemination and Help course. Um, so, she, you know, she has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine completions, according to this document. Uh, and uh, she was part of that big Arise uh, bus tour uh, with Sasha Stone and Scott McKay. And, you know, I have this image here. I guess they rented this bus and they went all around. Uh, and Robert David Steele, uh, the late Robert David Steele was there. This is an image of a video that he had. It looks like it's on the bus, uh, a stream uh, with, with Kevin Jenkins, uh, again, from the, the Florida, the chair of the Florida Children's Health Defense chapter. And later on, we're going to be talking a little bit more about secular technology um, that, that's being used in Scientology and promoted for a lot of social welfare programs, including education and rehabilitation in people returning from prison and people who are in addiction. Um, there, there's a, a picture of Kevin. Uh, this is from last September. He joins, uh, he has become the board chair of the Florida chapter as of last September. That's Kevin. And then, you know, I just want, want to mention, so Lee Dundas had this close tie to Robert David Steele, um, you know, connected to the bus tour. And when I was doing some research earlier about integral theory, I came across a slide share uh, that that's quite old of his, uh, actually from 2007. And the the, um, the it was one of those shared slide deck kind of things, and other people couldn't open it. So I actually took it was about 50 slides. I took screenshots of about half of them that I thought were really relevant. Um, and you know, I, I'll include it here in this diagram so you can access it yourself. Uh, but the, the title of his program is called Open Everything. We won, comma, let's self-govern. And it was delivered in August uh, August 10th, 2007 in Seattle. And uh, the next slide is sort of like, who is uh, Robert David Steele? And again, this is his, his, his slide deck. So this is how he would identify himself. Um, uh, oil brat, 20 years in Latin America, U.S. Marine Corps Infantry Command and Staff, Recovering CIA spy, three field tours, one chasing terrorists, two master's degrees, war college, CIA slash OIT, advanced IT and AI, created the U.S. Marine Corps Intelligence Command between 1988 and 1992, uh, husband, father, author, earth intelligence advocate, 
uh, world's most pissed off end user. And again, his, his focus throughout this entire thing is on open source intelligence, open source data. Uh, let me see, I'll just run through. Um, and it, it was very strange because he was talking about sort of like linking in Amazon. I think that was in one of the, uh, that we should have citizen-centered governance uh, with the cell, going through the cell phone, and that's the, the, the token cybernetics that I keep talking about. Uh, we should have an open source agency. And again, pay attention because the entire metaverse is being framed as open source. Uh, his Earth Intelligent Network was centering things called the Earth Game and the Earth Intelligence Network, uh, promoting sustainable peace uh, through the bottom of uh, the pyramid. And, and so he's sort of quoting F Buckminster Fuller here and also being a CIA asset, it's, it's a little concerning. Um, and he's talking about uh, essentially uh, sort of funneling everything through Amazon. I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's one of the one of the images here was like promoting the use of Amazon Web Services. And then it goes on to, you know, Raul Diego has a really important article about open source intelligence. But there, there's an image here of a ball field and they're talking about all the different kinds of intelligence that you could get. Um, open source intelligence, uh, human intelligence, signals intelligence, which is, I guess, the, the, the people, the coaches doing hand signals. Um, M-A-S-I-N-T, I'm not sure that one. And then there's I-M-I-N-T. And, and it's it has to do with like overviews from satellites. And so th the CIA guy is planning on sort of opening everything for a sustainable peace using technologies. And, you know, you know, up until the time he was, you know, riding around in a bus for a lot of times with Lee Dundas, the high level Scientologist, right? And then later on, we'll find out a little bit more about Scientology and some of the um, programs that they offer that would seem to be very in line with uh, a social impact finance. So, you know, I just wanted to clarify. Uh, so we, we had that Lee Dundas is her Scientology connections. Uh, but so when I was looking at the... Uh, uh, analysis of the, the October uh, 30th, 2022 registration by the California Attorney General, the form for the California chapter of Children's Health Defense. Uh, it lists, I think, six uh, six board members. Uh, one is Alexander Alexandra Mayer uh, of uh, Palo Alto. And I believe, I think she goes by Alex, A-L-I-X. And she has been a board member in the past. Uh, of Children's Health Defense, the, the main organization. Uh, Christina Kristen, uh, who is treasurer in Ross, California. She also has been a board member of the main group of Children's Health Defense. Uh, Maureen Block of San Rafael. Laura Kalb of Beverly Hills. And then there's an addendum. And then the next sheet is has an, a typed attachment. Uh, Lee Dundas of Orange, California as director. And then there's Tarina Eisner is also a director. So we know Tarina is a longtime member of Children's Health Defense. So I just wanted to show we've got, so we have Tony Muhammad is sort of the connection with Los Angeles and uh, you know the health freedom movement. Then we have Lee Dundas, who was at least at the time in 2020 of the origination of the California chapter connected. Uh, but what was even a little bit more amazing about this was finding out about Michael Baum. Um, and uh, so Michael Michael Baum is listed here on. Let's see. This is trying to remember which year, 2020, the 2020 990. He's listed as a member of the board. Uh, at the time, there were 19 board members. Many of them were new, and they were these California uh, chapter members. So you here you can see Christina Kristen, uh, Alex Mayer, and then Michael Baum. Uh, he's spending a little bit more time per week. Uh, it says he's he's spending uh, 10 hours a week, the rest are spending five. And he's a lawyer, and so he's involved in litigation. And so this is also from the uh, Form 2009-90. And if they were, they were paying consultants, um, that oh, more than $100,000, you have to list them. So both for 2020 and 2021, there were about five or six on each of those. They were different for each year. Uh, but Baum's firm 
uh, was receiving $214,000 in con uh, compensation as a consultant. Uh, his firm was Baum, Headland, Ariste, and Goldman. Now, it's, it's late, it's since changed the name is now Baum Wisner. Uh, and you can see here that it's 10940 Wiltshire Boulevard, 17th floor, Los Angeles, California, is the address for that. Now, that is the uh, address that we will see of the Children's Health Defense signing. I, do I have it right there? Maybe I, I'm sorry. I think I have it a little bit further on. So he is a uh, an advisor to the Children's Health Defense chapter, and he is probably best known for uh, successful litigation around Monsanto and Roundup. And again, um, good on him. That's, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, it's a good thing. I, I've heard from some other people. There's quite a bit of um, discussion of Mr. Baum uh, and his connection to Scientology. Strangely, it's mostly coming from the GMO food industry. So they're upset, but they're upset for like other reasons. And some of the articles are sort of poking at saying like, oh, well, because they made this historic uh, successful lawsuit about Roundup and cancer, uh, that actually beyond getting justice for the individual, uh, the, the, the plaintiff in the case, um, it opens up a huge, huge uh, source of potential revenue for other lawsuits. So um, so it's there, there's a financial benefit to not just like, you know, making the world a better place. Um, and then they were involved in uh, the, the Gardasil, some, some litigation around that. And I think that RFK Jr. was a co um, co-attorney on that case. So um, again, director, I, I would sort of wonder, and I don't know about you, but it seems a bit of a conflict of interest to be a member of a board and then also be getting a $214,000 uh, consulting fee. I, I, I don't know. Like, I mean, it seems to me that's a bit sketchy. Um, I mean, I know that you're probably an amazing law firm, but it seems like a conflict of interest that you shouldn't be a board member and then also be getting uh, money from the nonprofits that you're representing. Uh, here we can see that the name has since changed to uh, Wisner Baum. And uh, it says he has 40 years of experience. So he he looks pretty well preserved. Uh, later on, there's some stuff that comes up, like he was involved in some things in the 1970s. And so I think he probably is around my parents' age, which is at least like late 70s, early 80s. So um, Definitely someone with uh, a lot of experience. Oh, it's interesting. It says he became an attorney in 1985. Um, or maybe not. Maybe that's somebody else on his website. Okay. Um, okay. So so anyway, new, new firm name. Here we have uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was a co-counsel uh, with Wisner Baum and it was on the Gardasil uh, litigation. Okay. So, so they have a close working relationship. Um, uh, and are featured prominently on his website. Uh, so, so Michael Baum has Scientology connections as well. Um, and, and this is a little bit less, I guess it's uh, two, 1991 and 2005, according to this document, but I think it's not comprehensive. Um, this genetic literacy project, uh, science, not ideology, um, there's quite a bit on Mr. Baum at this particular website, but they're also pushing genetically mo genetically modified plants, um, which I don't support that idea. So uh, you know, take it for a grain of salt. Like maybe that you know, the people who share concerns are maybe not the people who share concerns and all the same things. Uh, but this is an article from 2021. Uh, Church of Scientology is the key driver of the glyphosate uh, glyphosate sorry glyphosate class action suits, and then it has a big picture of the Scientology headquarters in Los Angeles, and um, and then there was another uh, blog post, and I, I followed this up by looking at it a little more detail, uh, but it says that Los Angeles attorney Michael Baum and Operation Snow White, and that he was actually an unindicted co-conspirator who was participating in a covert operation by the Church of Scientology to uh, copy and steal records from government offices, including the IRS. And from this op the, the, the grand jury that went into effect around that, um, there were 11 highly placed church executives, including Mary Sue Hubbard, the wife of the late uh, founder, L. Ron Hubbard, uh, who pled guilty and were convicted in federal court of obstructing justice, burglary of government offices, and theft of documents and property. 
So, um, so Mr. Baum isn't just any Scientologist, right? He, um, so this happened, this Operation Snow White in the 1970s. And uh, yeah, so they were purging uh, records from government agencies. It said that they infiltrated 136 government agencies. So clearly these people are um, uh, like very connected. Um, Right. I mean, they have a lot of resources at their disposal. Um, they, it says that they committed infiltration, wiretapping, theft of documents, including of the IRS. And uh, a lot of this, I think, had to do with the fact that the, the Scientologists were trying to establish their position as a charity, as a religious charity uh, for tax purposes, because there's a lot of money, a lot, a lot of money connected to this. Um, and so it says, uh, th this, this, uh, Operation Snow White, the directives came out of something called the Guardian's Office. So that's at very high level. Like if you're an unindicted co-conspirator, like you're operating at the very high levels of the organization. Um, and this happened in the 1970s, right? So it's a long time ago, but it's very significant. Um, and that it was operating out of, uh, the Guardian's Office in St. Hill Manor in England. And and the U.S. headquarters, the Guardian's office was in Los Angeles, California. And, and what I've come to see is there's a lot of activity uh, in Los Angeles connected to the Scientologists. And so this is a screenshot uh, from some of these court proceedings. And again, unindicted. So for what it's worth, I'm not really sure how you could like be documented in court that you are part of stealing documents and that nothing happens to you. And then 10 years later, you, you know, get to or maybe even less, you know, practice law or, or you know, whatever. Um, but such as such as it is, um, we we don't know exactly what happened there. But this is uh, a screenshot of some of the the proceedings of how this thing went down. Uh, they were talking about this. Well, I'll just I'll just go ahead and read this whole page. Uh, th this will give you a sense of it. Um, so uh, Mr. Meisner brought a variety of lock picking tools to open the file cabinets within the Interpol liaison office. Uh, once again, he was unsuccessful and they left the building. I guess he wasn't a good luck pick. On a third occasion in mid-April, the defendant, Sharon Thomas, entered the Justice Department building with Mr. Meisner. This time they looked through the office for a combination to the safes and eventually found it in a file card box in the secretary's desk. After opening one of the two safes, they found the keys to the file cabinets and gained access to the documents. They took some three to four inches of documents out of the sixth floor Interpol offices to the fourth floor photocopying machine where they made copies or uh, or all of the documents with U.S. Uh, government equipment and supplies. Some two hours later, the defendant, Thomas and Meisner, left the building with stolen copies of the documents. Uh, Mr. Meisner made one more entry into the Interpol liaison office with the defendant, Sharon Thomas, and the Scientology covert operative, Michael Baum, through the use of Mr. Meisner's counterfeit IRS identification card. Uh, because the Guardian's office officials wanted all Interpol documents, whether related to Scientology or not, Mr. Meisner not only took some documents on this occasion, but also directed the defendant, Thomas, and Mr. Baum to make weekly entries into that office where they were to methodically examine each file cabinet for any Interpol documents. Uh, the documents taken on this occasion were photocopied using the fourth floor Justice Department photocopying equipment, as well as U.S. government supplies. Um, yeah, so so there this involved like high level covert operations and and counterfeit identification in government offices. I mean, that's pretty intense, right? And so um you know you know, I think in and, and then here's just an, another list of these unindicted co-conspirators. So he wasn't the only one. I guess uh the other people, L. Ron Hubbard, it's interesting. So he wasn't indicted, but his wife was. Uh, there's about one, two, three, four. There's maybe about 20 names here. And Michael Baum is near the bottom. Um, so so that's, yeah, Operation Snow White. Who, who knew, right? And, you know, I will just say it seems like the Scientology section, particularly in California, is really integral to, uh, like, activism around, uh, you know, around that removal of the religious exemption. And so one of the organizations that was really active in that space was uh, something called the Conscience Project. And uh, this Conscience Project was uh, run through this guy, uh, Greg, sorry, Greg Mitchell. Yeah, Greg, Greg Mitchell and his wife, Renee Besson, who I think are actually based in Virginia. Uh, but uh, Renee Besson is a high level uh, Scientologist. And they hired uh, this guy, Jonathan Lockwood, to be a um, 
sort of an activist in the space around that, uh, pushing back around that legislation. Uh, and Lockwood had done a lot of, he's at the time like really young guy, like, and, but he had a very long resume of, of political activism, particularly in the state of Colorado. I think at the time he might've also been working out of the state of Oregon. So uh, here's an image of the couple, Greg Mitchell and uh, Renee Basson. And they, it says that they're the Church of Scientology's uh, lobbying firm in Washington, DC. Uh, and so there you go. Like they're they're the lobbyists. Uh, th this is from a blog on Mark Rathburn Rathbun um, talking about uh, what Mitchell was up to uh, in D.C. in terms of uh, lobbying. And I guess he was lobbying around 2008 and 2011. And they were really interested because it turns out that the Scientologists also do have this criminon and narconon, these various sort of treatments, rehab programs. And they were really trying to get access to that through government contracts. And so this was a listing of sort of the, the game plan of what he was supposed to accomplish for them as a, a lobbyist uh, of, for the Church of Scientology. And, uh, you know, he was they were supposed to introduce various government officials to LRH, uh, that's uh, Hubbard secular tech. And, and you know, and I, I would say this secular tech idea, like we need to kind of understand it within the rise of a lot of this energy medicine, I think, especially remote energy medicine um, and apps and things like this is it, the, the early stuff of a lot of these apps like was sort of coming out of Scientology, like not exclusively, but there's a connection there. Um, and so in this uh, statement, it says that they were he was supposed to coordinate with ABLE, INT, and Narconon. These are these social welfare programs uh, and get the U.S. attorney uh, for Utah and the attorney general for Utah to sponsor setting up a Narconon, Narconon program and a detox delivery and to set up and deliver with official Utah government support. And we know, like I've, I've, I've said for a long time, um, Utah is really at the center. We are at the Mormon Transhumanist Conference. We know the NSA data centers there, so much of the early internet, biotech. Um, the LDS Church is very much involved in impact finance. Um, and you know, when I attended this event in DC, this Social Impact Partnerships Pay for Results Act, like it was Orrin Hatch at the time, he was still alive. And he was pitching that for Jim Sorensen, who was the main, one of the main pioneers in impact finance. So. So yeah, so the Scientologists like have an overlap. Uh, it's not just about uh, the health stuff. And I will say like the, the health aspect, and it, we'll get into this a little bit with the SSRI stuff later, uh, but they, um, you know, they're anti-psychiatry, they're anti-psychiatric drugs, um, but they have their own program, right? And their own program is connected not just for the benefit of the world, but to make money. And they want to, they, so they want to, on the one hand, keep their charity status as a religious organization, but on the other hand, sell their product of their secular technology. So um, this is just another list of some of his tasks. Uh, they, he got the Criminon program in a DC halfway house system. And again, it's sort of problem reaction solution. So, you know, I'm in Philadelphia. There are a lot of people who are interested in justice reform, bail reform, different issues, because really we did create um, a, a prison industrial complex. And that was the outlet for globalization and reduced labor productivity. If, if you have an unemployed person who's just out on the corner, um, they're not terribly contributing to being a revenue stream for someone. But if you can put them in prison and then start using them to generate uh, free labor and as a test bed for a lot of like health tech and other services, like you can make some money off of them, right? And it's 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 terrible to say that, but that was really what part of the the, the war on crime, you know, the war on drugs, war on crime, all of that stuff was about. Like the, um, and so now they're going to untangle that because they have the technology to profit on those people through e electronic incarceration, through monitoring systems, um, remote monitoring of prisoners. And so for many low level prisoners, um, you know, that's going to be an impact market and, and it's going to be driven by the technology systems. Um, and also there's a lot of re-education and reskilling that's going to be coming into it. So, you know, in Philly, there are quite a few organizations that are involved in like assisting returning citizens get jobs. And a lot of these benefit corporations are set up to accept ex-felons, but a pretty draconian 
uh, expectations of, of their workers. Um, th they're doing it not out of the kindness of their hearts, but because they can pay the least amount of money. So this criminon and narconon stuff is really important. Uh, so, okay, so this it continues on. The, these are for, for Mitchell's lobbying. Get the Second Chance Act to pass. Criminon and the Second Chance Program, we need to get them in use in the criminal rehab field. And then it says underneath, Mitchell also needs to get the Heritage Foundation, a leading Republican think tank, to support the idea of criminal reform. And that's happening. Like there, there's a lot of conservatives that are looking at criminal reform because now the private prison systems can get into social impact and continuum of care systems. And like even the Koch Industries, like the Koch brothers are into criminal justice reform. Like who knew, right? Because it's a market. And then it's saying that <clears throat> they're hoping to get earmarks for federal funding for this ABLE program. Um, and so they had, you know, quite a specific list um, for Mr. Mitchell on what they wanted to accomplish. Now, th this is just a screenshot from 2018 of me in the Dirksen Senate building protesting um, impact finance. And this is their celebration for the passage of this Social Impact Partnerships Pay for Results Act, which was largely, again, uh, Republican elected officials, Obama policy wonks, and hundreds of nonprofits that were looking to cash in on impact data. Um, and I, you know, my friend and I were the only people in the room who, who were opposing all of this happening. Um, but Orrin Hatch was leading the day, and this was very Utah-centered. Um, you know, Jim, Jim Sorensen was there, but I could, did not get a chance to give him a copy of my flyer saying, don't put babies on surveillance play tables. Uh, so this is this is the Mitchell firm's uh, website, uh, the Mitchell firm effective political communications, securing your rights and freedoms. And really their focus is on medical freedom and religious freedom. Um, and he so he he was an intern. He got his start in Pasadena, California. Um, again, Pasadena goes way back, you know, Caltech and a lot of the human betterment project stuff. I spent a lot of time looking into Pasadena, not just citrus. Um, so he was a. a, a in the district office of Congressman Carlos Moorhead. Uh, and, and then he became a chief of staff to James Rogan, uh, the majority leader of the California Senate. Uh, evidently, he looks a little bit like Bill Clinton, and he was an impersonator of Bill Clinton. Um, he worked for Rogan, who was on the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, who was also involved in telecommunications and the internet. Um, and evidently, Rogan played a leading role in the impeachment of uh, Clinton. He was the impeachment manager. And then in 2000, Greg Mitchell was a co-founder of Digital Campaigns, Inc., uh, a software with database solutions for online political campaigns. And so what I would say is like we need to consider a lot of the um, campaign tech in light of tokenized governance uh, and futarchy and these betting markets that are going to become from that, like all of the, the early stuff that happened really under the Obama campaign about using like data driven campaign analysis, that's going to be pivoting into um, like direct radical democracy with digital identity and AI, you know, proxy voting tokens. Um, so it's interesting to me that he has this background in the uh, political database system. And then it also said that he uh, served, uh, t was promoting school vouchers statewide. And it's, we'll get along, around to this in a bit, but the Scientologists are also pushing a lot of educational technology, which as we move into the uh, school choice and as people become either pushed out of school or disenfranchised with public schools, that's going to be a captive market for a lot of educational technology. And like hidden a couple layers behind some of that is actually Scientology. Um, and then later on, it says that he was he was on the uh, political team of President George Bush. Uh, let's see. He yeah, that was working on this campaign software. So um, so that's a little bit more about Mitchell. Here's his uh, lobbying profile from 2019. Uh, clients include Robert Brown. I should look up Robert Brown Church of Scientology International, the Hampton Center for Rehabilitation and Nursing. Again, a lot of these rehab centers, Moshi Margaretton and the Public Safety and Security Roundtable. So a lot of things are connected to justice reform. Uh, this is another uh, campaign finance data uh, lobbying income for the Mitchell firm. Uh, at this time, it said the Church of Scientology International was paying him $830,000. And then secondarily, uh, 200, his next largest client was the Open Society Policy Center. And so that's Soros. 
Um, and the bills that he was working on were the Second Chance Act and uh, National Criminal Justice Commission and fairness and drug sentencing and all these things. So again, I still come at things from a more progressive standpoint. And I know that these systems um, around sentencing were set up for uh, economic and political ideology purposes, not necessarily to make the world a better place. And I, I think that many of those laws are unfair. Like, remember, our presidential candidate, RFK Jr., was ar arrested for heroin possession, right? Um, and so I don't know when that happened for him in the 80s. I don't know if it predated all of the, you know, uh, drug war stuff. But like, I can see that there are problems, but now they're gonna unbundle that original problem uh, to continue to make money and continue to control people through the electronic surveillance systems. Uh, so just because the Republicans are about justice reform, it doesn't mean that they, they actually realized that what was happening was not good. Um, here's an article uh, from 2015, uh, the Scientology's lobbyist who works the halls of Congress for the church. Um, it says the controversial religious group has paid over a million dollars to Greg Mitchell in his lobbying efforts since 2003. So again, he he was connected, and this is in 2015, so this is tied in with the removal of the uh, religious waiver. Uh, and this isn't from the same article. Someone said, uh, let's see, he was like the sole lobbyist, right? So that's pretty significant. Um, and it says that his his work is aligned to broad humanitarian social initiatives. And again, a lot of the Scientologists are framed around human rights. There are these sort of front groups for human rights. Um, in his disclosure reports, Mitchell provided extensive details about his lobbying. Uh, the records show he is focused on several areas pursuing federal funding for Scientology's educational programs, and that's the ed tech. Disaster relief efforts, and I would say, like, Leo, if you're listening to this, like, your ears should prick up because the disaster stuff is something that's very much tied to the programmable money <laughs> and the catastrophe bonds. You've written about that. And then promoting efforts to help prisoners re-enter society. Uh, and, they, and working to promote programs to help religious workers immigrate to the U.S. and international religious freedom. And, and yeah, so that's his uh, health freedom and religious freedom. Although, interestingly, Scientology you know, it was very up in the air is if it was actually an official religion, in my understanding, in other countries, it's not seen as an official religion. Um, and it says that he he uh, has his personal belief in Scientology programs. I think I heard that he is a, mem a convert to that, but his wife is definitely high level. Um, and yeah, he just likes the programs like Criminon and, and, and uh, he likes to work with other religious groups in a multi-faith approach. And again, I keep saying that the faith communities are part of the impact finance space in a very, very big way. Now, when I was thinking about all of that, I was thinking about, you know, the Catholic Church, the Jewish faith, faith you know, uh, the Sharia compliant ESG investments, all of those things, the LDS Church. I wasn't thinking Scientology, honestly, guys, like Scientology wasn't anything that really occurred to me before. So... The fact that the Scientology lobbyist is also working on essentially ecumenicalism and bringing together like world peace and religious freedom, that was a bit of a shocker. And being paid uh, or funded by the Templeton Religion Trust. And you know, if you follow my work, you know I've talked about the Templeton Foundation a lot. Uh, John Templeton, his background was in mutual funds. He emigrated to uh, the Bahamas. He he gave up his U.S. citizenship and was knighted by the Queen. He had all of this money, uh, and he was focusing on giving it on character education, on um, uh, high-level uh, physics, on religion and free markets and genius. And so it's this idea, I think, of using markets to optimize for post-humanism, right? And so the fact that the Templeton Foundation is literally sponsoring this guy's IR IRF uh, summit uh, in 2021 with a, a $100,000 grant, covenantal pluralism. And again, I am... I will just restate, I think faith is important. I think connection to the sacred is really important. I have skepticism about the institutions broadly. I mean, I'm, I'm people can certainly, uh, you know, align with institutions, but I would say if you do, please make sh sure that they're gonna be on the right side about the impact finance thing, that they're not gonna do that. They're not gonna put people on blockchain to pursue their mission work. Um, but I do think that the One World Religion program is very much in action, and, and that, that that's gonna be part of this convergence, like like a, a One World Religion that allows for diverse uh, 
viewpoints, right? And I think this is what is being built out here with, with Greg Mitchell. And so we can see some of the partners from their 2022 summit. And, it, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to me because uh, the first line are this IRF summit uh, is meta. So we've got Facebook right, right in here. And um, yeah, and that's pretty crazy. And so I'm, I'm just going to go over, open up my Kumu map for a second. Uh, descent and um, uh, let's see, Vienna, oh, Drucker, yeah, Caroline Drucker. So I've talked before about Peter Drucker and Bob Buford and organized religion, especially sort of evangelical Christianity and the megachurch movement, and that Bob Buford was this cable TV guy in Dallas and a social entrepreneur. And he was empowering lay Christian leaders. And he had developed something called this leadership network uh, based in Dallas that was 400 plus large uh, mega churches. And within this, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think, there were these different organizations connected to Samaritan's Purse that you'll see that in a minute. That's Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's connection. And the mega church movement. Oh my gosh, I've lost. Sorry, thanks for being patient. There's a section where they're talking about essentially um, online churches, like the shift. I'm not sure if it's Saddleback, like Rick Warren, Saddleback. The, this guy Drucker is connected with all of these things. And they're working on uh, emerging church movements. Oh, here it is. It was right in front of me. The Metaverse Church, uh, the Shark Tank Fund Venture Fund, and a micro church. So the fact that Meta is on there, I think is really important. Yeah, so we can see the Metaverse Church, Metaverse Disciple Making, Metaverse Mission, Metaverse Churches, Metaverse Technologies. Um, and so they're building churches and they're training the children to want to do church online, to like Roblox kind of churches, um, free market church, um, micro churches. Uh, these are all being funded through this Shark Tank funding program. Uh, let me see, Lux, the Robloxian Christians, right? Uh, youth, to youth led ministries on Roblox. And so this is the direction this stuff is going. And this is why I'm saying like, we need to be really careful when we see things like this. Um, I'll just pull. Uh, mention a couple others. The Lantos Foundation. Tom Lantos is the grandfather of Tamika Tilleman. Again, he was a keynote presenter at the Mormon Transhumanist Conference. Uh, and he's, interestingly enough, he was from California and he was a Holocaust survivor, but then later converted to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So he was... Um, you know, and then Tamika Tillman continues that tradition. We have a B.Y. Brigham Young University Law School. Uh, we have the Baha'i. And again, Irvin Laszlo back in the day said that the Baha'i were going to be bringing together the One World Order Church because they were so scientific. Uh, we have the Catholic University. Um, again, the Catholics are deeply involved in impact finance in the Vatican. We've got the Heritage Foundation. And again, they're behind a lot of educational technology voucher systems. Uh, you've got the LDS Church and Deseret News. Here we've got the Aspen Institute over here. Remember, Mary Holland was a con connected to the Aspen Institute. Um, and we've got uh, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and the Church of Scientology and the Hungary Foundation. So Hungary is always playing um, a big role in this. Oh, and the Rab Rabbinical Assembly. So there's a lot of different organizations connected, but those are the ones that I've sort of, that relate to the research that I've been doing. And let me see. Uh, yeah, so I, I just want to point out too, Samaritan's Purse is one of them. And again, it's, it's connected to Franklin Graham. Uh, and what I didn't realize about Billy Graham, he actually came to prominence in Los Angeles again, interestingly enough, in 1949. And he was made into a national figure by William Randolph Hearst, the newspaper guy, right? And uh, William Randolph Hearst's mother, Phoebe, uh, she was a very rich widow. Her husband was a congressman who had made a bunch of money mining the Black Hills of South Dakota. So that's pretty bad karma. And she converted to uh, the Baha'i religion. And she then helped found parent-teacher associations for school and promoting universal kindergarten. So that's an interesting section um, about the uh, Samaritan's Purse. And, 
And then here we have uh, Mitchell uh, with the Conscience Coalition. And remember, the Conscience Coalition was working a lot in California opposing the, the bill to remove the religious exemption. And so he was with this IRF, the International Religious Freedom Roundtable. Uh, and here they are with with uh, with Mike Pence, you know, and, and uh, hosted by the U.S. Department of State. So they're they're in the White House with all of the various religions. And this is a tweet from February of 2020. Uh, the Conscience Coalition was at the National Prayer Breakfast, and it, it said it was an honor to be a part of this beautiful event. IRF Roundtable Chair Greg Mitchell. And so so he's at the, the prayer breakfast with his wife and uh, they're there for protecting religious freedom um, to to, you know, calling on Trump about uh, it's interesting about uh, the religious exemptions there. Uh, so, again, medical freedom, religious freedom, that's that's what Greg Mitchell is about. But again, deeply connected to Scientology. So here is Renee. And it's interesting. Um, so it says that she started her advocacy in 2015 in California, and she was organizing with medical freedom group leaders. And uh, she connected her husband with these freedom groups. And again, her husband was lobbying for Scientology and uh, for other things in DC. And uh, it says that she brings a professional background that pairs experience in the private sector with social betterment companies and nonprofits. Um, and then it says Philadelphia and California teams with a company that help rehabilitate challenge teens. While managing these teams, she connected the nonprofit with other leaders with Philadelphia Cares, Faith and Religious Organizations, Foster Care, which is a social impact bond program, schools and more. So she must have some connections to Philadelphia if she's working in this space. And I just want to articulate like one of the issues with um, special needs adults is that it's this group home setting, right? And they need supportive living environments and supportive living is one of these main social impact investment programs. But again, if you have someone in a, uh, who, who is unable to function, you know, independently <clears throat> live on their own, and maybe they've gotten to a, an age that they no longer have parents who are alive to advocate for them, then they're placed in these home settings and they're sort of at the whim of whoever are these providers are. And, you know, and I'm not saying they're all problematic. I, I think some of them are definitely problematic, especially because they're so resource intensive and these organizations are there to make a profit largely. So um, anyway, I have a lot of concerns around social impact finance and housing, supportive housing solutions for um, uh, people you know, who, who cannot live independently and are going to be under the, the control of uh, group home situations, because I, I think that, that there needs to be a lot of oversight in that. Um, here is her, her published list of Scientology, woohoo, all the way up to net OT8 in 2018. So she's done all the things starting in 1997. So again, she was right at the center of the, the California religious exemption conversation. And then they hired this guy, Jonathan Lockwood. And it's interesting because like he's political. He's just like a political hired gun. So if you go to his Twitter, like all of the things around this particular bill are, are scrubbed. He deleted all of his tweets about that. But you can still see when people replied or tagged him on things that those those still exist. But it's like he's he's erased this and moved on. Um, but he was the Conscience Coalition's uh uh, person in uh, in California at that time, and it, it describes the Conscience Coalition as a nonpartisan nonprofit pulling together like-minded groups from across America to increase the three C's: communication, cooperation, and coordination to unite and win, bringing together conscience rights and medical freedom groups in California through grassroots organizing. Okay, so they were so so the the tentacles of the California. Uh, children's Health Defense chapter goes back this far. And and here we have Renee on a tweet and she's, uh, the tweet says, that's my hus hubby, Greg Mitchell. Thanks for posting. This bill is so important. And uh, the, the tweet she's referencing is from a Holly Harris in 2018. Uh, just a few members of the uh, CJ Reform Squad, that's hashtag Criminal Justice Reform Squad, at the White House for POTUS endorsement of legislation moving on the Hill. But it was stories of formerly incarcerated that changed hearts and minds today. 
Um, and then it's at FAMMF Foundation, Freedom Works, Cut 50, and ACU for Justice. So these are conservatives for judicial reform. And that has everything to do with social impact finance that's coming online. So we create the problem and then we, we sell you the solution because now we can, we can track people um, separately. So that is in 2018. And I just want to sort of point out, this is some work that I was doing in Little Sis. And unfortunately, these maps got erased and they didn't get saved. Um, but a lot of them had to do with like criminal justice reform. I think, I can't remember if it's, I think it might be United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 16. It's either 12 or 16. One is smart cities and one is justice reform. Um, and so a lot of stuff is about human rights. But again, it's this dual use. It's human rights to the extent that we can create problems and then manage people within the solutions that we've pre-decided. So a lot of people who have been incarcerated are being set up for the reskilling program. And I know Jason's been doing some really good work lately around um, the ASU GSV and this idea of alternative credentialing and non-traditional learning environments. And so uh, incarcerated people as part of this reentry program are kind of literally a captive audience for these programs that are now literally online ed tech. And they're all often linked to uh, mental health programs too. So there's like behavioral remediation through online tech and then light, like life skills and then cognitive learning pathways. Um, and so this is an image from Little Sis called the Second Chance Pell Grant Program. Uh, and it was launched by Obama to train um, formerly incarcerated or incarcerated students. So these are people who are still in prison. And they were using these uh, tablet-based education systems that were specifically for corrections as part of a pathways from prison to post-secondary education with the Vera Institute. And the Vera Institute is, is a core play, a key player in the, the anti-recidivism social impact bonds. And, uh, it, and it was recommended by this My Brother's Keeper, and Michael Bloomberg was really connected to My Brother's Keeper, and that's rather Orwellian. So they're, they're targeting people in prison. Now, look, we see the Kellogg Foundation is a funder. Now, they're eugenics. Uh, the Sunshine Lady Foundation, which is uh, Doris Buffett, sister of Warren, and again, uh, I guess that would make aunt of Peter, the Cassell, uh, social emotional learning funding guy. Uh, Open Society, so that's Soros, uh, the Gates Foundation and the Ford Foundation. And so what they're, t they're essentially RAND and the Vera Institute were saying that you would have this cost offset of $5 for every investment you put in over three years in unlocking potential through educational technology in prisons. And again, a lot of that is data mining. And there was a program um, that came, that was part of something called an impact security. So when the governments run out of money, uh, they're going to go through, um, they're going to still have their public-private partnerships, but without the public. And so what the MPX organization did was create a way of funneling money through for-profit investments and um, foundations. And the test pilot for this project was called The Last Mile. And it was an impact security project in San Quentin. And so a lot of these programs are tested because the Bay Area in San Quentin prison. And um, so the idea was that you would train prisoners, people who are incarcerated, to do coding work. And in that training process, they would essentially do prison labor and they would make a premium as prison labor standards go. Like instead of maybe making $4 in a prison laundry, they would make $14 or something like that. But the um, uh, even that, that the wage that they were being paid, which is a lot for a prisoner, is undercutting the regular wage of regular coders who are outside of prison. So it's a way of like depressing wages for others. And this last mile project was backed by a lot of important organizations, um, including... You know what? I'm gonna just I'm gonna click through to this and just uh, walk through. So, who is donating to this last mile uh, prison coding project? Well, Google gave them two million dollars. Uh, so that's that's something right there. Um, they had okay. So Impact Genome <clears throat> was a was a partner. They were doing the analysis of the social impact. There's something called uh, Mission Measurement, which was predictive analytics about social outcomes. Uh, and then we've got Richard Branson, who was an investor, uh, Omidyar Network, so that's Pierre Omidyar, and NPX. And so there were some pretty major players in, in this last mile program. Uh, and this is what, the when the conservatives are interested in <clears throat> criminal justice, 
That's why, because it's going to be a market. And so this is one of the organizations that was part of this tweet, the ACUF for Justice, uh, Smart on Crime and Public Safety, Human Dignity Director, and you know, conservativejusticereform.com. And so I think we also need to understand that this is going to happen within um, the context of the for-profit prison systems, right? The, the GEO Group and the Core Civics. And so uh, let's see. Uh, this is Greg Mitchell again. This is an article about his ABLE program uh, and the work that he has done. Um, it says that Greg Mitchell has gotten crime and on delivery started in the DC halfway house system. And he has congressmen from Illinois, Michigan, and Utah interested in the programs. His flat rate of 3000 is being paid by the church with some sundry expenses. He will be taken off the flat rate is going to be played on a byproduct basis. And that the major target is to get Greg Mitchell to create reaches for LRH tech and SBC delivery from congressional terminals and knocking out psych tech from the fields of drugs, education, and criminal rehab. And again, that the Scientologists are very anti-psychiatric drugs. Um, so because they have their own approach. Uh, so here, this is just another uh, second chance month, uh, you know, conservatives for for justice, reforming the justice system because it's gonna be an impact program. And I guess this is just Jonathan Lockwood. Again, he was the conscience guy uh, working on the uh, opposing the passage of the, vac uh, the exemption, religious exemption. Interestingly enough, he's now the VP for communication since January for the uh, uh, Muwekma Ohlone tribe, which are the tribal people of the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, but he had a really, so, and there's nothing in his LinkedIn that ever says that he worked for the conscience group. Um, he does ha mention that he is self-employed from 2017 to the present, doing various projects, including a strategy management for political firms and medical clinics. Uh, he was head of this PR firm in uh, Look in LA. Uh, he was a director of policy and communication for the state of Oregon and Salem for a while. This is all more recent. Uh, he has a long uh, list of work with something called Advancing Colorado in May of 2015 to December of 2016. So I don't know if he was in California before that, but uh, Colorado, again, is the blockchain state. And so he was working on, it looks like, progressive uh, causes in Colorado. And uh, before that, he was part of something called G Generation Opportunity and uh, Compass Colorado. And I'm, uh, you know, so like a lot of this early grassroots uh, political organizing is what Lockwood was up to, but not really much about uh, about his his what he was doing in California. Now, this is someone, uh, Hibiscus Tea, they only have 24 subscribers uh, and it's from a couple years old, uh, but this is a short video that was made about Lockwood. Um, and at the time, his Twitter feed said PR, data, tech, AI, bioethics, and policy. And uh, this is a short clip, it's only three minutes. Um, I don't know that I'm going to play it for you, but essentially uh, they were concerned that he was spending a lot of time in Florida uh, during the lockdowns and going back and forth and being connected to a lot of health freedom movement people in Florida. And they were trying to figure out what that was about. Here's here's his executive director of the Conscience Coalition. Wow, this is this is as of 2019. So I guess he's still involved, even though it's not on his website. Um Let's see, and this is an article, this is an article again about, about the bill. Why is Scientology apparently assisting the opposition of SB 276? Um, it's not the first time I've noticed connections between anti-vaxxers and Scientology. For, ex for instance, during the battle to get SB 277 passed, Tony Muhammad and the Nation of Islam teamed up with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Brian Hooker to rally in opposition to two, uh, SB 277. Um, and again, I, that's not a lot of new information, but yeah, just about the Nation of Islam. And so here's the Crimenon program. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, reviewed by the Urban Institute Justice Policy Center, and this is 2006. And they were talking about mentioning, uh, again, this the way to happiness, which sounds a lot like Tony Muhammad's program. And they touch on this idea of moral recognition therapy, which is a kind of cognitive behavioral therapy 
that was actually used in a social impact bond that I've talked about, the Ventura County Social Impact Bond. It was developed originally in Tennessee. And while it's not strictly Scientology, it seems to be informed by Scientology. And this was an article um, in Vice, uh, How Wall Street Dehumanized Teenage Inmates with Scientology-Infused Therapy. Uh, this is what happened when Goldman Sachs Cash paid for teenage inmates on Rikers Island to try a bizarre therapy tinged with Scientology. Now, it turns out the Rikers Island, that social impact bond did fail, but I think it was because they actually had people drop out of the program and they didn't have enough to have a control group. Uh, but this moral recognition therapy was also used in the Ventura County social impact bond. And this is one, you know, when I first uh, started presenting on these topics in uh uh, at the beginning, like when Jason came and interviewed me, you know, I really wanted to convey uh, uh, Justin Leroy did a great talk on uh, social impact bonds as the afterlife of slavery. And he presented that talk in like 2015. No, it must have been 2017. Um, yeah, because it because this didn't happen until 2017. Um tied to this social impact bond specifically. And it was with a colleague who is a, a, an artist in ready-made items. Uh, his name is Cameron Rowland, who's actually from, the, from Philadelphia, from Mount Airy. And as part of a, an exhibit on debt, Cameron Rowland used his uh, payment to uh, buy into this social impact bond so he could frame it and make it available for public review because you couldn't get it otherwise. Um, so if you, if you look on this Ventura County uh, impact bond, uh, and this is the entry from the Government Outcomes Lab in Oxford. Uh, this is a really key program. They were using moral recognition therapy. And yeah, you can see the intervention description is uh, re-entry focused services, including a combination of moral recognition therapy, trauma therapy, relationship building, and employment support. So this moral recognition therapy was in there. And this is social finance, again, Ronald Cohen promoting um, this tackling recidivism in Ventura County. And at the bottom, you can see the list of the partners and supporters, uh, in, in, including you know, um, the California Board of State and Community Corrections, the Reinvestment Fund, the Nonprofit Finance Fund, and the Whitney Museum of American Art, because they were one of the funders because of Cal Cameron Rowland's project. And then I'm not going to read through all of this, but he he... He framed the bond itself and then he wrote an essay about the problems with the social impact bond infrastructure. And none of this has gone away. None of this has gone away. Um, here's here's the talk itself. And if you haven't listened to it, um, you know, look it up in in here and and listen to it because it's it's pretty important. It's it's about an hour long talk. And it is. It is the new form of, of slavery. And then I just have a, a Wikipedia entry here about Crimenon, uh, which is the Scientology's uh, program for rehabilitating prisoners. Uh, and it said it was spawned from the Narconon International Program in 2000 and part of the Association for Better Living and Education's Outreach, and that's the ABLE. So, uh, and then there's another Scientology-related prison program called Second Chance. Um, and so I'm bringing this in because what I'm saying is like there, the, the Scientology involvement in uh, the religious freedom exemption, like we should be wary because it's going to bleed over into other things, including um, educational technology. Uh, let's see. Oh, I just, okay. Sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. I do have the uh, Articles of Incorporation for the Children's Health Defense California chapter, and it does have the initial street address of the corporation, which is 10940 Wiltshire Boulevard, 17th floor, Los Angeles. Uh, you can see that uh, right, right there. And then um, uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see, like that's their Articles of Incorporation. And then, yeah, and you can see it here as well. So this is this is the address they've since he since changed his law firm's name. Uh, it's now the Baum, uh, uh, Wisner, and and they've relocated offices. But you can see that the lookup it's the same, the Wiltshire Boulevard, and and actually it was the same on the consultants list. So um, you know, very very direct connection there. And just to point out, if people like are not familiar, um, I actually had. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard in my map that I did with with Lynn on Pegasus Park, uh, because they're, they're uh, you know, who who knew, right? So this is the the um, X 
actually, this is my other map. This is my map about eugenics. So the Human Betterment Project was in Pasadena. And so I have Caltech in here uh, connected to the Human Betterment Project eugenics program, uh, which is in Pasadena. And and not too far from Caltech is where uh, Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard conducted this Babylon working occult ritual in 1946, uh, which was this uh, sex magic program. Um, and uh, he was part of the Ordo, uh, OTO Ordo Templi Orientis Agape uh, Lodge, Jack Parsons was in, in Pasadena. And so L. Ron Hubbard, besides being a science fiction author, was like, literally intimately involved in this sex magic ritual work. Um, here I have uh, another map that sort of features him in the context of uh, Frank Molina, who was a, a collaborator on some rocket work at the JPAL lab. And, and you know, Frank Molina is the father of Roger Molina, uh, husband of Christine Maxwell, Ghislaine's Maxwell's sister. Um, so I, I have them in two, I have the, the the uh, Babylon working uh, in two of my, and, and L. Ron Hubbard in two of my maps. Um, so that's, that's, you know, I just, I don't really know, like do people who join, sign up for Scientology know this back history? I mean, you think that they would and do they think it's okay? Um, here I have a, an article from 2019 in a book, um, Eloquent Blood, the Goddess Babylon and Construction of Femininities in Western Esotericism. And there's a chapter five, uh, her banner is unfolded, Babylon and scarlet femininities in the writings of Jack Parsons. And in the abstract, it says, uh, the chapter introduces and discusses how Babylon was interpreted by the American rocket scientist and uh, Themalite uh, John Whiteside Jack Parsons. In 1946, Parsons undertook a series of magical operations aided by his lover, Marjorie Cameron and L. Ron Hubbard with the aim of manifesting Babylon on earth as a human woman. Uh, likely influenced by libertarian socialist and feminist ideas, Parsons believed Babylon would incarnate as a messianic figure connected to female emancipation, religious freedom, and sexual liberation. A few years later, Parsons proclaimed himself the Antichrist and thought to promote a version of witchcraft that venerated Babylon uh, alongside Lucifer. <laughs> so again, um, you know, I, I just keep thinking back to this, um, uh, you know, this idea that they're sitting, oh no, here it is, you know, sitting here in 2015, you know, alongside like a noted Scientologist, right? Um, and in a Scientology program, like you would know this, right? I mean, I'm, you would think like over time that you would be cautious about who you're affiliating with, right? I mean, you just because someone is fighting for a cause that you're also fighting for doesn't necessarily mean that you have to sit down at the same table with them and align with them. It's um, <laughs> it's a little bit it's a little bit sho shocking, especially again when you find out that 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 Michael Baum was part of the the operation uh, Snow White. Uh, it's it's just. To me, it, it shows, and again, this is someone who, you know, wants to be president, right? And, and, and I just have to wonder about some of the decision, this decision making that's, that's happening there. Um, so I, I talked some about the social impact bonds and, okay, I guess in Scientology, there's, for the auditing, there are these electronic systems, the e-meter or the electro-psychometer. Um, that maybe dates back to Russia in the late 19th century, these early electrical systems that are part of the auditing process. And, and I guess I've seen some things online that say it's really not that complicated, but they're super fancy and, um, you know, they cost a lot of money, these things, but they're, they're technically not that complex. And I just do want to sort of emphasize this, this idea of interfacing with electricity and uh, like electromagnetism and technology to attain certain mental states is something that we're seeing a lot more of with the alternative health community and like telemedicine and remote medical treatments. And, um, you know, for the most part, I think these people who espouse this belief system are imagining that, that this is their answer as opposed to psychiatric medication, that this is what they're proposing is the solution. And, um, you know, I can see this being put into some of these uh, social impact bond uh, centers, right? Um, maybe against people's wills. And I also want to mention something called uh, continuous care pathways because I mentioned about uh, like adults who are uh, needing supportive housing. 
Uh, so that's a certain group. Uh, the people in prison are a certain group being targeted. The prison system is a central focus cost offset for social impact bonds. Uh, this is an article from UVA called Risk Versus Return Social Impact Bonds and Lowering Returns to Prison from February 2020. Prison culture, uh, the finance of prisons are really central to a lot of educational technology and mental health technology and behavioral compliance technology. Um, I wrote an article um, in 2018 about a, a technology, a prison technology that was piloted in, here in Philadelphia called Adovo. And uh, it was actually developed by a guy who is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, whose father was a prison warden. And this system was an online tablet-based uh, computer program that uh, families at that time, when it was first piloted, they would have to pay into an account. And then the prisoners would have would be compelled to do a certain amount of like mental health training or educational training in order to access entertainment. So you could you could get a movie or something or a video, but you had to jump through the hoops first through these cognitive behavioral therapy programs or these online education programs. And we can imagine that there are many, many of these technologies coming to pass. Here's another uh, picture of it. They're very uh, they're focused for jails, they're very sturdy, they're indestructible. Uh, you can see on this one, uh, this is an article, what Chicago jail education entrepreneurs learned working in Philadelphia's prisons. This is close to my heart, this happened in my community, right? And, and so you've got a profile and you have courses taken, lessons completed, certificates earned, points earned. And what they, what they said was essentially this was acting like a drug, like as they, it was sort of a, 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 a drug component. Um, and it was funded by the MacArthur Foundation. They were they were the the grant. It was not a very large grant. It was like I think thirty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, but deeply embedded in, in the impact finance space. Uh, the UVA Nudge Solutions Lab was part of it. Uh, there were different services that were involved, including Impact Engines, uh, Caper Capital, Mitchell Caper. That's Lotus Notes. Um, Good Company Ventures was an impact investing partner and Fast Forward Philadelphia. And that was a, a Michael Bloomberg and Bloomberg Challenge like paid for that. Um, so and here here's the entry for Brian Hill. Uh, he was working on uh, mobile banking, right? And so we've got here, we've got Bobby down. He's going to go down to Florida and, and talk about crypto being the answer to our resilient uh, economic ecology. Uh, but the guy who's doing Adobo prison tokenization was was working in mobile banking and essentially digital um you know, mind control programs. And uh, he, you know, he came out of, of Brigham Young and is, is a member of the church, the LDS church. So, you know, I, this is really concerning to me. And I wrote a whole pro, uh, a whole article uh, back in 2020, January of 2020, called Prison Reform to Incarcerate the World, Smart Justice and Global Finance, and really centering the fact that the incarceration model is going to be coming. And that actually the for-profit prison systems, uh, Geo Group and Core Civic, are both uh, paying less to guards and hiring more social workers. And the social workers are managing continuum of care in terms of re-entry, uh, cognitive behavioral treatment and supportive services. And this is all going to be one giant impact market. Like pull people in on minor crimes, process them, and get them in on cybernetic pathways. So I think Core Civic is the one in Florida and uh, Geo Group is in Tennessee. Uh, big business. This is really big business. And in one of the things we were talking about, the Second Chance program, it's allied with the Scientologists. And it said that it, you know, I would encourage people to look at this. I skimmed it. It was a really long article about all of the problems with the Second Chance program. Um, uh, and I guess they operated in Albuquerque between 1995 and 2009. Now, I will also point out that Albuquerque is home to Sandia National Labs, which is a Department of Energy lab that's doing a lot of transmedia learning and stuff. So like, who knows what exactly was going on in Albuquerque, but eventually they got shut down. Um, yeah, I think I've covered all of this about the prison education stuff before. This is just an image of, you know, the last mile changing lives through tech. So they get you captured and then they get you put on a pathway. 
I was a little shocked to, to find out today that NPX Securities has actually gone out of business as of December, because to me, this seemed like a really important concept, but maybe they can develop the concept. I don't think the concept's going away, but this business of paying for outcomes, uh, they couldn't make it work. Uh, so they, they shut down, but they were partnered with Global Citizen um, on impact-based for-profit financial products. And all of this was like survival of the fittest. It was definitely a free market approach. Um, uh, this this is an article uh, uh, about about it. One of the people was connected to uh, Wharton was a Wharton alum, and yeah. So NPX is what's going to happen. The impact security when the governments run out of money. And I made a, a, a diagram of this a while back about how this would work with pre K finance. And, and it's interesting because this will segue into our other thing about Scientology is that they're actually the largest donor to the uh, to Scientology is the guy who created ABC Mouse, which is pre-K uh, delivery services. So talk about like controlling consciousness, right? Cognitive domain management. <coughs> um, in this uh, in this project of an impact security. <clears throat> you no longer have the public in the public-private partnership because the public has been bankrupted. The public was there to assign you a digital identity and make you available for investment by global um, portfolios uh, in impact. Uh, in this model, you don't have the government anymore. You, you have a program, like a nonprofit, like a pre-K provider, and they're they, they offer a, a, like an outcomes-based contract uh, again, they call them social impact bonds, but they're not true bonds. It's simply a, a contract. These will be smart contracts. And you can have an investor uh, pay for the program. And if it meets uh, the success metrics, a donor will pay back the investor plus a certain amount of agreed upon profit, right? And so uh, the investor could be a mission-related investment from a foundation or a pension, a community foundation, a donor-advised fund. Again, we, I keep talking about how it's really sketchy that Children's Health Defense is telling everybody to give through these donor-advised funds so that donations are untrackable. A corporation could invest, a government, an NGO, a venture philanthropy fund, or some other venture capital. So, um, And then the donors are obligated, these are our foundations, to give 5% of their assets annually to charity. Um, and so that's what would be paying it back, assuming that the targets are met. And so the thought experiment I used was, like, imagine you've got a pre-K provider that's organized as a benefit corporation uh, that... Is, is available for these social impact uh, MRIs, and uh, you can you can defer your capital gains. Uh, maybe they're in an opportunity zone, so you get a deal in the opportunity zone. It's eligible for the seed funding for the CIPRA, the Social Impact Partnerships Pay for Results. Uh, they float a deal to provide uh, uh, pre-K services, including uh, data mining kids on surveillance play tables or on tablets. Um, and just picture, like you could put, say, imagine Hewlett Packard is the investor. And the technology infrastructure for the preschool is provided by Hewlett Packard. And then ultimately, someone like the William and uh, Flora Hewlett Foundation that's working on open education resources and deeper learning and philanthropy engineering could pay back uh, Hewlett Packard, the company, right? And you could substitute many of these technology companies for Hewlett Packard, right? You could do uh, Microsoft and Gates. Uh, you could do uh, the Dell Corporation and the Dell Foundation. Like there are almost unlimited numbers of people who are playing both sides. And so, um, and again, these pre-K providers could be churches, right? Or maybe not even, I mean, because we're even talking about, uh, you know, online pre-K, which is what Sorensen was up to. So, so here is uh, Doug During. Um, let me see. Where is Doug During? Oh, he's down. Is he further down? Oh, yeah. So here's a picture of him. Uh, Scientologist Doug and Lori Doring, D-O-H-R-I-N-G, Doring, Doring, owners of Age of Learning Incorporated, parentheses ABC Mouse, fined $10 million by the FTC for their illegal marketing and billing practices. <laughs> And I'm sure I guess 10 million is sort of a drop in the bucket. So I, I remember a woman early on, and my child was too old to be exposed to ABC Mouse, but like I remembered even going into the public libraries. And again, I mean, I've talked before about how all these PBS Kids apps programs are part of the data mining. But I didn't realize that Scientology also had 
an ed tech component, right? Because they're secular technology, right? Uh, they've got technology for rehab and they have technology for education. And they have been in the business of the Los Angeles County school systems for a long time and wiggling their way into the Florida schools as well. And so I would just ask to consider like within the last three years, many people have been driven out of the public schools for various reasons. And oftentimes those people are like falling into online uh, technology for homeschool or alternate or into a micro school that's using online programs too. Um, so I, I sort of feel like we know Heritage Foundation and these other folks are working on getting blockchain digital vouchers for school choice. And so what happens when all the people like the entire um, education system falls apart and fragments and parents are left trying to navigate stuff. And, and again, Scientology, they're very good at like packaging companies that you don't know unless you start looking that there are Scientology, that you sign your kid up for an online education program and it's it's not what you think, right? So um, so this guy, Tony Ortega, he's uh, you know written a lot about it. Uh, here we have Tom Cruise in 2003 at the ground opening of the Applied Scholastics headquarters in Missouri. <laughs> And um, so, yeah, so it's they're, they're teaching. They're, they're not only providing materials and books, but they're uh, they're teaching teachers. Um, it says Applied Scholastics is one of several operations that fall under the Association for Better Living and Education staffed by Sea Org workers, uh, Scientologists who have signed billion year contracts promising to come back lifetime after lifetime to promote Scientology. So um, so Applied Scholastics is in Missouri. Here is a, a screenshot from the Scientology Los Angeles website, and it's talking about applied scholastics. And there's a, a group of kids in the schoolyard, and it says that they have a teacher training campus near St. Louis um, that has implemented L. Ron Hubbard study technology for, from through more than 1,100 schools and tutoring groups in 72 countries. And nearly 135,000 educators have been trained in applied scholastics uh, to bring this study technology to 38 million students worldwide um, to defeat literacy and raise the level of education. Now, I'm going to say that there are a lot of social impact bonds that are around early literacy, specifically early childhood literacy. It's pre-K and it's early literacy, uh, kindergarten through third grade specifically. Um, and one of the first impact bonds in California, Santa Clara, was a literacy impact bond. Um, so this is concerning. I did not even know that this exists. And like they're, all, they're already reaching out to 38 million students. Um, and this is, let's see, this is something... I guess this is from a blog and they said that this was happening within the last couple of years, like going back to school. Um, it's a tweet or I don't know if it's a tweet or it's from maybe a, an online group, a screenshot uh, from an Olivia Watson talking about that ever, all of the members of the Scientology groups should uh, do outreach to their local schools to Google schools near me, pick a school and contact them and then recommend this curriculum to them. Um, specifically targeting Los Angeles. Uh, and, and they give a script. Hello, name. My name is blank, and I'm an education reform activist looking to help re improve education in Los Angeles. I'm sending over a free resource that will help your teachers improve their students' literacy and test scores. Um, I've included a link to a free manual for your teachers, Barriers to Study. The guide provides a simple method for identifying when students are having trouble absorbing material, gives exact tools for getting them unstuck and achieving full conceptual understanding. These study tools are being used by countless educators across 70 countries and are statistically proven to help students focus in class, recover from ADHD-like symptoms, retain information, and be able to use what they've learned. Here is a free guide. Share it with your teachers. If you start using it, I would love to hear back. Um, your name, volunteer, education reform, applied scholastics. I've emailed 10 schools in LA so far. Can you do 10 for me today? Comment with how many people you've emailed. Now, I'll just point out that a lot of this language about like uh, statistically proven, um, uh, you know, uh, let's see, the statistically proven exact tools, uh, ADHD, like a lot of this is kind of like, we're hearing a lot more in the education about like neural programming of kids, right? And this seems in line. And again, the evidence uh, and statistical stuff for test scores is all about the impact markets, the early literacy impact markets. Um, 
this is from 1990, guys. I'm, I mean, I'm a little shocked. This goes back so far. So this is really pre-ed tech. But they were doing assemblies with environmental groups. And again, so we've got, like, I haven't really done a deep dive into Scientology and the environmental stuff. But, um, you know, clearly RFK Jr. is in that space as well. So, you know, that's interesting. Um, so this is from a 1990 newspaper article, I think the LA Times. A principal of a Sherman Oaks Elementary School has canceled an assembly by an environmental group because of fears that parents would object to the organization's connection to Scientology. Um, the event, which was to include an appearance by child actor Vani Ribisi, was to kick off a year-long study of environmental issues such as recycling and air pollution. Principal Grace Snipper said, Ribisi starred in the canceled TV show My Two Dads. I don't know the first thing about the Church of Scientology, but it would be a waste of time to have people worrying about whether or not we are trying to expound the teachings of Scientology, Snipper says. We can teach environmental lessons in some other way, right? So... So, yeah, and it's called study tech. So this is a whole nother, you know, it has an example of some of the, the, the basic study manual, study skills for life by L. Ron Hubbard. Um, evidently in 1997, Linda Smith wanted to start a charter school using the study tech manuals. Uh, this is uh, Learning How to Learn by L. Ron Hubbard. So they have various books that could go along with it. Um, this is a... This is something from more recently, Secular Scientific, uh, Scientology, sorry, Secular Scientology. Um, and just, you know, looking at these different outlets from Scientology, the central organization, which include the, the Ways to Happiness, uh, Narconon, Wise, Applied Scholastics, all the different uh, sectors that it's coming in on. And, and I really had no idea. Um, uh, this is another one that is critiquing. And it's interesting because these people are actually uh, promoting religious freedom, but they're concerned about Scientology as being a new age and uh, concerns about getting these materials into schools and um, that people don't really know what's happening. And um, and then evidently uh, uh, Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith are hiring teachers who are Scientologists for their new school. This was in 2008. And so again, it went from homeschooling um, to uh, a micro school kind of model. They called it a new village academy. Uh, this is uh, Scientology Link rouses worries at Stars School, LA Times, uh, June of 2008. And uh, yeah, it started out as a, a homeschool for the Smith's youngest children and those of several other families. Some of the staff members are Scientologists. Uh, one teaching method uses study technology, which is developed by Hubbard and focuses on students gaining hands-on experience, mastering subject matter before moving on and being taught not to read past words they don't understand. And I would say like the hands-on experience and mastering the subject does seem to feel like fall in line with competency and proficiency-based education. Um, and they're just saying like, oh, this methodology doesn't really have anything to do with Scientology. It's just how we do it. Um, and then here is another article about from Tampa, the Tampa Bay Times, uh, the controversy over Scientology influenced Cloud's future at Pinellas Charter School. And uh, that, that school was called the Life Force Arts and Technology Academy in Tampa's Ybor Square. And a lot of these are targeting uh, low income families and black and brown communities. And this, again, brought in Nation of Islam through company president Hanan Islam, who was also executive director of the World Literacy Crusade, a California organization that promotes Scientology study message. She had reassured her parents that her group would not push religion in schools. And uh, every teacher was given learning how to learn an illustrated children's book from L. Ron Hubbard. And they were trained in the Smart Way Phonics program. And then the teachers were trained at their flagship resort in Clearwater. And they were, you know, essentially taught about word clearing and different things. And it was sort of like, well, you're at a charter school. So if, if you don't want to do this, like you can just leave, right? Um, it says Islam and uh, Tony Mohammed were joined in leading life leading life force by the founder of the World Li oh sorry uh, World Literacy Crusade the Reverend Alfredo Johnson who flew in from California to give the keynote speech at a life force fundraiser he uh, Johnson is a regular speaker at Scientology events and a longtime proponent of Hubbard's study tech um, he was the speaker for Scientology's Ebony Awakening Awards and yeah so they're definitely targeting and here here is something else in Florida the company gave away 10 million books um, and 
let's see, had a, the company giving free books to Florida had a $10 million settlement for deception. So this is the ABC mouse stuff. And when people, I guess it's a subscription program, but it, the, the website was structured so that you couldn't figure out how to log off of it. Uh, this is the age of learning and the Doug Doring, who, uh, you know, multimillionaire. And he, he made a lot of money in the Neo, the game Neopets. And so I think a lot of these online gaming systems are part of like guided evolution and team building and complexity theory. So he sold Neopets to Viacom in 2005 for $160 million and then moved into this ABC Mouse platform uh, that has 10,000 activities for children. Um, it says Doring is also one of the world's top donors to the Church of Scientology, where he's he a longtime member. He and his wife had donated at least $20 million to Scientology, according to their internal magazine. Um, uh, and and but they, they were charged with, uh, the, well, they had this FTC settlement. Um, let's see, the, the representative Chris Lit Litvala of Clearwater sent out mailers through his political committee to Pinellas County constituents touting the partnership with ABC Learning. On Monday, Latvala said he did not know about the FTC settlement or the charges of illegal marketing and billing practices of ABC Learning before he endorsed the partnership with the state. So again, um, doing sort of sketchy things. Here's during talking about uh, ABC Mouse. Uh, no, actually, yeah. ABC Mouse, a the Age of Learning is a UNESCO Global Education Coalition. So like Lynn, if you're around, the UNESCO footprint is all in this. Here is a, a picture of him at the UNESCO, the Education World Forum um, in 2020. And he, he before the Neopets, he actually made a bunch of money in uh, market research and surveys around the automotive industry, which seems weird. Um, but that's his early money. And I would say, to me, what jumps out is it seems a little bit like Qualtrics, which is connected to the LDS Church in Salt Lake City, that, that these firms that are making a lot of money in research surveys have these other, like Qualtrics is then like moving into other things related to, like they were doing a lot of work related to COVID data tracking. Uh, the Neopets thing, uh, that was through immersive advertising. And I, I think immersive advertising is something that we need to keep an eye on, um, uh, that, uh, that that's what's coming is this, this rea immersive reality is going to be full of advertising. Just, you know, think about Tom Cruise and walking through and having all the stores in extended reality yelling at you based on your social credit score. Um, at, the, at the time that he was working on it, uh, there were 50,000 new accounts every day. And these were primarily children and especially girls. Um, and let me see, I thought I had a little bit more about that, the immersive advertising. Maybe that was all it was. Um, yeah, so, yep. I, I was a little bit shocked to find out about ABC Mouse. Uh, ABC Mouse is also a funder of PBS Kids. <laughs> they funded like 15 of uh, PBS Kids programs, including uh, Curious George, Arthur, um, I don't know, I don't see Molly of Denali. Some I only know Curious George and Arthur, but some of these others. So big funder, deep pockets. We can see here in the Miami-Dade Public Library System, ABC Mouse is available on their database system. Uh, and uh, here's a whole uh, article. It's an older article. It's from 2000. And this is actually on Carnegie Mellon's uh, server, which is a little weird to me. But it's talking about their fraudulent study technology. And they've done an assessment. Because I'm sure Carnegie Mellon has all sorts of other educational technology that they're interested in promoting. Um, but... Anyway, that's, oh, this is, I guess I put it in the wrong space. So here's a little bit more about Neopets. I just, I, I cause I think this is really important. It's like the crypto kitties, it's genetic algorithms and guided evolution. So evidently Neopets, and, and I kind of saw this again when my child had some of these webkins that there was, there were games and built in. And so I think the game, some of these games verged on gambling, which was controversial because it's essentially encouraging kids to gamble. Uh, and these games were built on the, the structure of blackjack and lottery scratch cards. Uh, so that was a controversy around Neopets. Uh, in the 2000s, it was considered one of the stickiest uh, children's entertainment sites, meaning one that had got kids to spend the most time on it. Um, <clears throat> it was this immersive advertising uh, so you couldn't even tell what was actually advertising um, in, in the space. It was unclear what the advertising wasn't 
obvious and a lot of it was interactive and tied to the games. Um, it encouraged kids to spend a lot of time and, and link them to consumer. Uh, and again, this is di digital materialism, right? Consuming digital goods, collecting digital goods. This is this was set. This was 20 years ago, setting up kids for the digital economy that we're seeing today. This is the long lead time. Um, and then there were uh, it was mixed reality so that there were these tie ins like transmedia where they would have cross promotion in real life, clothing, jewelry, stickers, cereals, video games that that embed were embedded then in in um, the digital world and bringing the online and offline worlds together, which is crucial. And um, yeah, within the games, uh, the games had different genres, different puzzles. And I can see on the back end that this might have been connected to sort of teaming and data mining uh, and that th there were quests embedded. And so the quests are these challenges that are going to be connected to group mind. And they did have their own digital virtual economy in NeoPoints based on the gaming and uh, transactions among the players. Uh, so again, I think it's really important to see what this was. And again, understanding that this guy is totally connected to Scientology, the ABC mouse, um, and that Scientology has been targeting Los Angeles schools, charter schools, Florida schools since the 90s, and they're doing, you know, teacher training programs. Um, uh, I think I'm just finishing at this out. I will mention, too, this idea of the clear, um, that, that this idea that you have a reactive mind, and that is what their technology is helping you clear your rea reactivity. Uh, in the, the Wikipedia entry for clear Scientology, it... It says that religious scholar Pat Cooks co compares being clear to the concept of nirvana in Zen Buddhism. Having a clear state of mind is highly desirable. And so I, I want to run this quick clip by you from this guy, uh, Leonid Burr, who, according to this, it says that he is a Harvard scientist, although I couldn't find anything about Harvard on his LinkedIn or anything about him, but about um, mind control weapons. And I pulled this clip because it helped me to understand how um, to enter into a group mind, we need to have ego death. Like we need to get to a place where our our body is fluid with everything else. And that is what the group mind consciousness state is about. And so I think a lot of the stuff that's being pushed in schools, like the mindfulness practices, the executive function practices, the meditation practices are being, take out, being taken out of their culturally appropriate context with respect to like meditation and being used to condition minds for uh, these... Um, you know, non-surgical, eventually, you know, non-surgical uh, brain computer interfaces and to enter into a group mind scenario. And so I can sort of see a connection between achieving like a clear state and a non-reactive mind and the ego death and what they need to do to bring us into this uh, next phase of uh, evolution. Uh, I have a little bit of stuff on on Leonid Burr. I was trying to look him up. There was not a lot there. Uh, he It seems like he's connected to nutrition supplements. Um, so yeah, this now foods and I, I'm, again, I'm, I'm also a little con concerned about some of these like nutrition supplement types of things too. But, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and I'll play this. Let me move over to the, sorry, I'm trying to lost my cursor. Oh, there. Oh yeah. Okay. Wasn't there another experiment done where they connected like a, a, a human and a brain, a human brain and a monkey's brain? There was. How do you know about that one? I, um, I heard about it. There I don't was remember a, where I heard about that. I was a girl. Yes, and an ape in the and army an experiment. I think it was in the 60s. I might have heard you talk about well, it. maybe. And, uh, and it didn't end well. What they were trying to do is cybernetically link, and that's the term when you connect. Uh, Who was doing this study? Uh, it was the Army and one other group, and okay. I can't remember. Um, and uh, they were hoping, because they, you, they didn't break down the, <laughs> it all comes together, so give me a chance here. They weren't able to break down the ego of the ape. Or the girl per se, so their brains, the brains, the, the, the the young girl that was used as experiment to be able to break down what the ego, ego. Okay. So sense of self, we all right. have a sense of self. Right. We believe 
we're separated from everybody else. And even though we have two hemispheres of the brain, we believe we're one brain. Right. You know, it's an illusion, optical illusion, yeah. uh, delusion of consciousness, as Einstein says. Um, so what happened is when they put the girl in the cage, the eight tore apart, um, they weren't, it wasn't able to recognize her as an extension of itself. Mm. And I believe this is part of the reason of the breakdown, the torture that TIs are experiencing is they have to break down the ego in order to be part of a greater mind or mind control. All right. So, yeah. So I think that's an important uh, idea. I mean, this, this idea of ego and, sorry, I'm not I'm kind of, Trying to get my cursor over here. Uh, sorry. Um, so the the idea of the the ego uh, and mind and consciousness, right? And so these th this idea of these vulnerable communities, like uh, whether they be children in educational settings, whether they be people in rehabilitation settings, uh, being connected to these education these various kinds of technologies. Uh, in psychological states. And again, the framing is not about drugs. It's about using the technology to achieve something. But I, I really do think that the what's driving all of this is a collective consciousness, is the hive mind consciousness towards a biohybrid computer system. And so I think it's important to understand, like, when I, when I look and see about Scientology being involved in the social impact finance space and being involved in the pushback around, you know, medical freedom, that sort of thing, I, I can't help but think that there is some other thing going on. This is a very, very, very powerful organization. Um, and so, you know, I just, I want to sort of put that out there. And before I get into the last part about the SSRI stuff, I do want to mention one of the articles, uh, I mentioned that a lot of it is very tricky. Um, you know, the the Scientologists have like various human rights groups that 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 they they do. And if you don't know what it is, you just think it's human rights. Uh, but this guy Tony Ortega, I think, who keeps a close eye on what's going on in Scientology, and a lot of people feed him tips. Uh, this is way back in 2013, so 10 years ago. Uh, but Carrie Kennedy, um, who is RFK Jr.'s sister, uh, was in, and she's in charge of. Uh, the uh, it says that at the time she was chair of Amnesty International USA and the head of her father's uh, foundation for human rights, uh, that she was uh, on lined up to present at an, an event called Artists for Human Rights uh, in on May 1st, 2013. And this person who knows such things, it says that uh, she, she essentially this is a, a Scientology group and within the description of her bio it says that she also in 2010 she founded RFK Compass which convenes leaders in the financial industry to consider the impact of human rights violations environmental degradation and corruption on investment outcomes and that's a pretty interesting thing I haven't spent a lot of time looking into RFK Compass but that seems like, I mean, again, by 2010, the, the impact finance sector was gearing up in 2008, um, 2007, 2008. So by 2010, that would sort of be known. So it's interesting of thinking of human rights as a cost offset. So I did look up, it, the hosts are Ann Archer, Donna and Mark were, um, or were to be, Ann Archer, Donna and Mark Isham, Terry Jastro, Kelly Preston, Julie Burke, Vanessa Stoller, and Scott Pfeiffer. Um, and it had an RSVP. Now, Later, I saw a follow-up that said, oops, uh, something just came up and Carrie Kennedy unfortunately can't participate in our event. Uh, so I don't know what happened if she maybe became aware of what it actually was or she was aware that other people were aware of what it was, but um, it got delayed at the time. And I guess I, it's unknown if that event actually totally happened. Um, but I did look up the various people to see like, Oh, are they Scientologists? Like, is there a public record? And um, and so they were. Um, Ann Archer, Fatal Attraction, prominent Scientologist. I have a picture of her. And then I have, um, I think this is her husband, Mark Isham, musician and composer uh, on the What is Scientology page. Uh, what is Scientology page? This is Terry Jastrow, TV producer and director. Uh, 
This is the late uh, Kelly Preston. I think she was John Travolta's wife. Uh, Julie Burke, not a lot on her, but she had some listed having completions there. And uh, this is uh, Vanessa Stoller, president of the Church of Scientology, Mission of Beverly Hills, at the grand opening of Lilly's Learning Center, a literacy and tutoring project using study technology. And so I think like if you guys care about education, stuff like I do, like this is something we should be paying a lot of attention to. And and then I just have a screenshot of uh, global education and advancing human rights from the Scientology page and has pictures of the UN and various groups. And uh, again, if you were not aware of what it actually was, because my understanding is um, there are many, many people who might question the, the treatment uh, of, of people by, by this particular group. Um, yeah, you, you might be drawn in. So human human rights, and, and interestingly enough to think about human rights as a cost offset for impact investing. Uh, so now I'm sort of wrapping up. I'm going to get to this SSRI litigation. I, I will point out that Michael Baum, um, in his law, legal career, you know, he had the, the glyphosate uh, success, but he also, uh, his team, uh, it, it says, uh, this is on his bio, uh, Michael Lynn Baum and his team helped uncover the link between SSRI antidepressants and heart birth defects. Over the past few years, he has been an instrumental figure in the litigation against the makers of Pats, pa Paxil, Prozac, and other major antidepressant manufacturers. Um, Mr. Baum's efforts in the pharmaceutical field have helped initiate significant changes in the industry. He has played an important role in the implementation of safety measures such as the black box warnings that now appear on most antidepressants. Okay, so this is something that he is known for um, in addition to the Monsanto. And uh, in fact, his law firm, Wisner, current law firm, Wisner Baum, he had, they have a whole archive of Wisner Baum's SSRI documents uh, starting in, I think, uh, it says the results of the FDA's ongoing meta-analysis of suicidality data from adult antidepressant trials. Um, all, a lot of PDFs. This is just a, one screenshot about one of them, but there are a lot of different PDFs related to this. And um, so this is uh, a, sh a short clip of him, but it's saying that like, if you stop taking it, some people never recover. Like they, they suffer long-term side effects. Um, and among the side effects, so I'm uh, I'm including, so this, this is an SSRI uh, fluvoxamine that is being promoted as an early treatment for COVID. Um, and these are the side effects for fluvoxamine um, from Medline Plus, uh, specifically targeting children. A small number of children, teenagers, and youths up to, 14, up, up to 24 years of age who took antidepressants or mood elevators such as fluvoxamine during clinical studies became suicidal. You should know that your mental health may change in unexpected ways when you take fluvoxamine or other antidepressants. Now that's that's pretty serious. And I'm just emphasizing that this has been advanced as um, a COVID early treatment drug by many in the health freedom movement. Okay, uh, other side effects, drowsiness, dry mouth, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, stomach pain, constipation, indigestion, gas, change in taste, stuffy nose, decreased appetite, sweating, difficulty in sleeping, weight loss, nervousness, and then at the end, sexual problems in males, decreased sex drive, inability to get or keep an erection or delayed or absent ejaculation, and sexual problems in females, decreased sex drive or delayed orgasm or unable to have an orgasm, okay? This is a pretty serious side effect, and um, I haven't looked into all the things, but someone you know that I've been consulting with said that they've been looking at it very closely and they're very very troubling especially the the sexual aspects the sexual side effects are harmful and again may continue on may be permanent permanent damage called um, caused and so uh, this is a, a study from the Indian Journal of Psychological Medicine uh, let's see I don't I don't see the oh uh July 2012, and the title of the article is Fluvoxamine Plays an Integral Role in the Alteration of Sexual Behavior Pattern More in Females Than Males. And so this is this has been studied. And I have to wonder, like, 
you know, with all of the finger pointing about things being done on purpose, like who was in charge of all of this? Who was deciding to make uh, repurposing these drugs acceptable? Uh, this is from uh, World Psychiatry, June 2022, repurposing fluvoxamine and other psychiatric medications for COVID-19 and other conditions. All right. And so again, I keep talking about repurposed drugs. And, you know, I know that there are a lot of concerns in the, you know, health freedom community around uh, reproduction, reproduction and impacts on reproduction. So how is it that this drug is, is sneaking in, not from the mainstream outlet per se, but these FLCCC doctors, right? And these FLCC doctors, you know, have their treatment protocols and fl fluvoxamine is still in there. It now has a warning, but, you know, um, and it says updated to include the warning because for most of the time it was up, it did not have a warning. But here is, there's, there's something on their website, FLCCC in the news, these doctors are presenting at the Children's Health Defense Conference uh, in Tennessee last fall. All right, so, so there is a connection between Children's Health Defense and these doctors. Uh, here is the screenshot of their I Care Early COVID Treatment Guide. You can see FLCCC Alliance there. And underneath it says updates, fluvoxamine de-emphasized and risks highlighted. Well, that wasn't at the beginning. And you know, so what would have happened that led that them to put that on there, right? Because they didn't, they're doctors. They should have known this, right? They should have known all of the, the, the potentially terrible side effects, but they didn't say anything for a long time about it. Like were there terrible outcomes of people who took those drugs unknowingly? Um, uh, it, it, and fluvoxamine is an SSSRI. So the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, some people who are prescribed it experience acute anxiety and can be suicidal and they should be cautioned about that. So, um, so you know, here we have the COVID early treatment fund, uh, Steve Kirsch, again, he's promoting uh, early uh, treatment drugs. Uh, this is on their website. Uh, it is a screenshot. It says CTF, CETF's work featured in 60 minutes. On Sunday, March 7th, 60 Minutes featured CETF in a story about using fluvoxamine as an early treatment for COVID-19. And then there's a tweet about it. Uh, sh uh, Sunday, Sharon Alfonsi reports on how a 40-year-old antidepressant became a possible candidate for early treatment of COVID. This is crazy. Like, and again, if like, how is 60 Minutes not knowing that this is dangerous, right? And, and, and Steve Kirsch is promoting this as as a solution, right? And then, and then we've got here. Um, he did his own study. Uh, he supported a randomized uh, trial in these drugs, and uh, and it was a. Uh, it says, uh, in summary, all fluvoxamine treated patients did not meet the study endpoint. The study appeared as a lead story in in JAMA on November 12, twenty twenty. Intrigued by the results, founder Steve Kirsch accepted an invitation to discuss the findings in a virtual meeting of the Harvard Business School Association of Northern California, led by David Seftel, the physician at Golden Gates Fields Horse Racetrack in Berkeley. I mean, and then on November uh, 21st, within days of the virtual Harvard meeting, a mass COVID-19 outbreak occurred. Uh, and oh, by the way, Dr. Seftel offered his patients the, op the option to take fluvoxamine, right? And so this is insanity, right? All of these, like, don't you see some flags, right? Like this is on 60 Minutes. The Harvard Business Group is promoting it. Steve Kirsch is behind this. Um, and it's just, it's really clear that this is a very problematic drug. Um, and again, just the screenshot, Steve Kirsch, Steve Kirsch's newsletter, I'm forming a super PAC to draft RFK Jr. to run for president, February 13th, 2023. And, you know, here's me and my video talking about mismanaging a pandemic and the use of repurposed and early treatment drugs, including ones that make people suicidal and give them potentially uh, permanent uh, sexual dysfunction. Uh, and I keep saying that that this is happening, like they're creating DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations for medicine, um, for uh, psychedelics, uh, and also for for this one. This th this is a screenshot uh, from a guy presenting for Protocol Labs. Uh, fairly recently, uh, impact markets for public good medicine using pay for success contracts. They're counting this as a public good medicine, right? Sava. Curdemelidus. Uh, examples of repurposing opportunities. Number nine, fluvoxamine for potential therapeutic action against COVID-19. Right? 
there's something wrong, people. This is crazy. This is crazy. Like, what is this movement these people have joined? Like, it's insanity. And then, so I ask, you know, this person I was corresponding with, like, do you think it's in the Fauci book? Is fluoxamine in the Fauci book? Well, yes. Yes, it is in the Fauci book. It's in the Fauci book, and they're talking about, the, like, uh, I'll just read the section so you can have it. Um, independent physicians unaffiliated with the government or universities that are so dependent on doc Dr. Fauci's good favor were discovering new COVID treatments by the day. And I guess that would be Kirsch. Researchers treated 738 randomly selected Brazilian COVID-19 patients with another adjuvant, fluvoxamine, identified early in the pandemic for its potential to reduce cytokine storms. Another 733 received a placebo between January 20th and August 6th of 2021. The researchers tracked every patient receiving fluvoxamine during the trial for 28 days and found about 30% reduction in events among those receiving fluvoxamine uh, compared to those who did not. Like almost all other remedies, it is cheap and proven safe by long use. This is right out of the presidential candidate's mouth, assuming he wrote this. <laughs> Like almost all other remedies, it is cheap and proven safe by long use. Fluvoxamine costs about $4 per dente course. Fluvoxamine has been used since the 1990s and its safety profile is well known. I don't know what to say. I mean, that's, that's a mess. Um, and then I will point out that, so uh, Peter Bregan, who has really, uh, focused a lot on issues of uh, the dangers of these SSRIs as Michael Baum, right? Like, how is Michael Baum on a board of directors of Children's Health Defense? And he's seeing that there are associations made with doctors who are promoting this drug and, and that that just, he's okay to stay associated with them, right? So, I mean, from what I understand, this article from Bregan only came out in January of 2023 that he's finally saying that uh, Luvox fluvoxamine is too dangerous to treat COVID, right? And so again, I don't know where Bregan was early on when the FLCCC doctors were rolling it out, but at least he's on the record now. And he's saying that it is, it is um, years ago, it became apparent to me that fluvoxamine was the most dangerous SSRI antidepressant, causing high rates of mania and psychosis and incidents of suicide and violence. Although fluvoxamine is in the treatment of COVID-19 is recommended for only 10 days, that relatively short period may not prevent its worst adverse psychiatric effects, which often occur early in treatment, as well as during changes in doses, which is how they have them, people treating, you take short doses. So they're putting people in harm's way, right? Um, and this is just going on. It says that he, um, uh, that it could actually worsen people's symptoms, like the depression that people have with COVID. Um, and that uh, Eric Harris, the Columbine shooter, was on Luvox, uh, taking a prescribed increasing doses for many months right up until his suicide at the end of the Columbine shootings. I was a legal medical expert in cases related to the Columbine shootings, and I was empowered to read his medical records, although major news outlets have denied that Harris was taking any psychiatric drugs at the time of the mass murders. His coroner's report states that Harris had a therapeutic le drug level of fluvoxamine in his blood. I have made the coroner's report available. And then later on, it's, it says um, in 2003, Solve and the FDA agreed to withdraw the trademark distribution of Luvox in the U.S. while both protested very loudly. It was not for safety reasons. So, I mean, I think we just have a lot of questions um, about all of these things. Um, I'm going to save Ted Kennedy for later because I'm a little bit tired. Um, I will just touch on, I forgot this one, Narcanon got raided in Atlanta. That was in 2013 for insurance fraud and had to rescind their um, their license for a while. I guess they got to reapply for it. But Narcanon of Georgia surrenders its license to the state. So, you know, these programs are really problematic. Um, so I know that this may seem like it was a bit in a lot of different directions, but I just want to point out, um, again, just by way of recapping, um, Tony Muhammad uh, involved in the children's health defense film, Medical Apartheid, and a close associate of the organization of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. since 2015 in California. Uh, Lee Dundas, uh, who was connected with this RISE tour and the whatever, the January 6th event, and uh, uh, that she, you know, Scientologist. And Michael Baum, not only Scientologist, but involved in covert operations stealing government documents back in the 1970s. 
Um, and then these inconsistencies, again, that he's a board member and that he's also getting paid as a consultant uh, and that he's a board member and he's like seeing things. Surely he saw things with these doctors seeing fluvoxamine and continued his association with an organization that was featuring and promoting this. Um, and just that that I think the the Scientology piece with between the ed tech and these various kind of rehab treatments and these technologies has to be given really careful consideration where it's going because a lot of it's hidden from view. And why would Children's Health Defense um, seek to align itself uh, with an organization that has a pretty checkered history, um, shall we say. So um, anyway, it's getting to be the dinner hour. Uh, thanks for uh, hanging out with me today. I hope you will ask some questions um, of Children's Health Defense. Um, again, also ask like if Mary Holland is is on leave, uh, why is she still on the Children's Health Defense TV shows, right? I mean, there's just so many questions about like, you know, how things are supposed to be and how they really are. So anyway, guys, thanks a lot.